ole. Nii, tere kõigile ja kõigepealt ma ütlen Eesti keeles, kuna Eesti inimene ilma vifita ei ole nõus elama, et on siis riigikogu võrk, riigikogu nimeline ja parool on lossiplats.1a ja lossi ja plats on suure tähega. Et kuigi nüüd järgmisteks tunditeks me oleks hästi rõõmsad, kui te oleksite siin kohal. So, welcome everyone and for the... Opening words, uh, just to say that we are going to be talking in English today in the honor of our uh, guests from the UK. And we also are very happy to invite uh, the ambassador of, uh, of the Uni uh, United Kingdom, uh, Ms. Teresa Boubert, please. Thank you very much, Yoko, and good morning. I must admit, I'm slightly astonished to see so many people here this morning. I thought wrongly that this was perhaps a, a niche subject for a niche audience, and I'm absolutely delighted to, to be proven wrong. It happens quite a lot to ambassadors, actually. We're, we're shown, to be, shown to be wrong. Um, there are lots and lots of reasons why I personally and my embassy team are very happy to be supporting this event. Um, the first one, I thought of is, I don't know about you, I suspect you feel the same as me, I'm sure members of parliament do, that we are under pressure all the time to be doing something. What are you going to do? Something must be done. Um, and you know that builds up and builds up into all of our busy lives. And I have personally found it very useful to be reminded or to remember that sometimes the right thing to do is nothing for a minute or two, or a little bit longer if you have time, um, and that it only takes a minute or two to declutter your kind of mental hard drive and start again, and start refreshed and start better, um, and to stop constantly thinking about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and so on. We all do it, but um, it's, it's, there's a real knack, a real, a real way of learning how to stop doing that and just give ourselves a little bit of physical and mental breathing space. Um, the idea being, as I'm sure Chris and Jamie will, will, will make clear later, um, that this is not so much about um, sort of repairing damage, uh, but very, very much about preventing it and making sure that we have the techniques we need to spot those moments in advance um, and to, to deal with them, those potential moments of overload. Um, and we've been working here, the British Council have been working um, with teenagers and young people on improving children's mental health in Estonia. Um, that's also a project that I'm very, very proud to be associated with. And this uh, mindfulness is a very big part of that. So uh, Chris and Jamie came to the embassy yesterday to talk to me and my staff and to give us a, a taster of mindfulness. Um, I have to say that after an afternoon and an evening with them, my deputy was so happy that she bought me flowers this morning. <laughs> and she told me specifically that was because two minutes of mindfulness had made her feel really, really good. So anyone else who wants to bring me flowers, the British Embassy is just down the road. I'd be delighted to, uh, to, to see you. Um, and the, the third and final reason why we will why we're happy to support this is that um, I will do almost anything to help Yoko as the, the chair of our friendship group and as a lady with uh, fantastic ideas. I know they're fantastic because they're almost exactly the same as mine. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, genuinely very happy to, to help her um, and I hope to help all of you. So um, I can't stay, I'm afraid, very long with you uh, this morning. Uh, because, of course, I need to be doing something and I need to get on to the, to the next thing. But uh, as a direct result of the session yesterday, I'm not going to jump in my car and read my emails to go 300 metres back to the embassy. I'm going to walk. I'm going to enjoy the Estonian spring and the sunshine. And I absolutely guarantee that all of you, by the end of this event today, will be wanting to do the same, that you will be feeling more relaxed and that you will definitely be twice as effective. So thank you, Chris and Jamie. Thank you very much, Yoko, and have a great day.
So thanks a lot, Teresa, for these uh, kind words. This event couldn't take place without the support and our um, really very, very good cooperation with the British Embassy. And uh, my own story is this, that when I uh, came into Parliament around three years ago, I had always, uh, since I think from high school, been interested in these themes of uh, self-development and, uh, and I think it's the, uh, the main goal of every person is to actually advance in these kind of uh, competences of being a human being. And I was very happy that after, um, after a while, or actually even before I uh, came into Parliament, uh, Janus Jaska, who is the second person to be blamed for this uh, event to take place, uh, approached me and uh, told me about the uh, Minutes of Silence uh, initiative in Estonia, about bringing these uh, competences to the Estonian children. And, uh, and definitely we found the, uh, the common language quite quickly. And thanks to Janus also, I was approached one day by this uh, colleague from the UK, Chris Ruan, who you will be hearing later. And uh, Chris and I had a long Skype call and, uh, and uh, he told me about all the things that they are doing in the UK, what they have been doing for years already, and, uh, and how they are broadening their initiative to bring these themes to the rest of the world. And after that call, I really thought like this is one of the reasons why I needed to be a member of this parliament. And, and it a little bit felt like uh, the ice somehow in, in some themes is really moving now and it's our role to, to help it and, uh, and keep it moving. And later I was uh, invited to the UK to, to meet both the people in the UK who are behind this and also other uh, politicians from the rest of the world and you will hear about this later as well. Now a few words about our day today. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about uh, why I think this is important for Estonia. Uh, Janus will tell you what we are already doing in Estonia, but we will keep our talks very brief because we are mainly focusing today uh, on uh, actually hearing the, uh, the story of the UK. And we have two guests, we have Chris and we have Jamie Bristow, and they will be telling us the, about the experience uh, in the UK. And after our little... Um, break. I'm sure that uh, Jamie will also uh, do a little mini session So, because mindfulness is not about theory, it's actually mainly about practice. But uh, now about, um, about why I think this is important for Estonia, we are talking a lot about the, uh, the population. We are so few in this country that we actually somehow fear that maybe we will not be uh, as, an, as a nationality on this planet for a very long time. And I have also been a member of this uh, committee for the population crisis. And I think the, the focus, instead of trying to uh, raise the number of uh, people, of course it's nice with kids and nice with lots of people, but I think uh, the main point here is that we should, as leaders, make sure that every person has the environment to be his or her best self. This is the way to make uh, Estonia bigger. And, uh, and when we talk about the workforce, that it's uh, is also, I think our business people are saying that the main, uh, main problem or the main sort of bottleneck in uh, Estonian uh, productivity and business is the lack of the right workforce or the lack of workforce. I think in this sense as well, again, uh, if we look at um, what the uh, industrialization did a couple of hundred years ago, the machines took away uh, the hard labor. They sort of were, came instead of our uh, muscle power. And then maybe as people, we, as a result of this, became physically a little bit weaker. But now we have a new revolution. We have this revolution of the IT of the communication, we have all these gadgets. And I think we all have experienced, either in ourselves or definitely with our kids, the next generation, that also this revolution is changing something in the human beings. I think it is this kind of um, cognitive competencies and in a way uh, the gadgets have already changed our, uh, uh, like our uh, competencies of uh, attention our uh, concentration 
and and also we see this in uh, schools. Uh, we have a raising uh, level of stress, depression among the young people. Obviously, also uh, uh, with some parts of the the, the grown-ups. And I think this uh, these are all issues that show us that these human capabilities, these skills that we should be teaching the stars of tomorrow are exactly these things that the computers cannot do. And these will be the skills that are valued today in the workforce and definitely will be valued tomorrow. Because every person who is going to uh, run a business or, or, or is thinking of a new business model, if he or she is considering whether to actually invest in a robot or whether to hire a person, the person needs to have or definitely has some kind of um, uh, things that the robot cannot do. And these are the human qualities, the uh, working together, the empathy, the emotional uh, qualities. Uh, these are all the skills that we need to prepare our kids for. And if we want to stay active, if we want to be productive in our work life, this is what we need to be working on. Because actually the rest of it you can look up on the internet. So I think this is, uh, this is what, one of the main reasons. Now if we go, um, we talk a lot about school reform, but it actually all starts at home. I think if, uh, if things are wrong at home, if the parental skills aren't there, it is definitely very difficult for the school to make it all right again. So again, another field, um, being also a mother of four kids, I think I have uh, seen it coming, what it can mean to actually uh, burn through as a, or burn out as a parent. I think these are all issues that uh, this world where we are expected in very many different um, uh, roles to be perfect in very many different roles. And if we also talk about what social media has done, it has actually made uh, every person a brand in a way. You have to lead your own career, you have your own Facebook page, you have maybe your web page, you have your LinkedIn page. And this somehow creates a feeling that we as persons are all brands. But if this is this, what happens then if you fail or if you are afraid of failing? Does this stop you from developing this fear and how do you tackle this? And I think uh, techniques such as mindfulness can actually help you understand that there is something beneath all these roles, some very human basic uh, qualities that are not defined by the fact that you are a mother, that you are a woman, that you are a member of the parliament, that you are a, a, like a business leader, that you are a worker. These things are all uh, in a way uh, secondary. But underneath this, there is something that cannot fail in a way and that cannot also succeed, like a level where we are all in a way very equal and very human. And I think this, um, this mindfulness technique uh, have a way of, um, of making us uh, or giving us this space in our heads to actually uh, look and find this thing that is always there. And, um, and I think it's, uh, it's a great thing that these, uh, even if these gadgets are all like uh, taking our attention outwards, maybe even thanks to this, there is a growing need which is also being articulated that we also every now and then need to turn the look inside again as well. So, so there is never uh, one side to a story, there is always two sides and I think, uh, think therefore we, should, we shouldn't uh, be critical only about technology we should just uh, put our priorities right and understand what is our uh, role as human beings, what is our main goal, and not forget that, that this is something that lies there inside. So now I am very happy to invite uh, Janus to tell us a little bit about what we ha are doing in Estonia, because I am very happy to say we are doing a lot already in this field. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, warmest welcome also from my behalf, uh, on behalf of Vaikus and Minutid, uh, Minutes of Stillness. Um, my name is Jan Janus Joska and um, I'm uh, lucky uh, to be leading an incredible group of instructors, instructors, volunteers, experts and parents from all walks of life, uh, many of whom are present here uh, in this room today. And the mission of uh, Vaikus and Minutid is to bring mindfulness and self-regulation skills uh, such as the ability to focus and handle stress to all schools and kindergartens through Estonian educational system. And this is actually our second conference to raise awareness about what mindfulness is and how can we use it. And our guest speaker, <coughs> excuse me, Jamie Bristow will explain mindfulness in greater detail. My presentation intends uh, to give an overview of the mindfulness-related developments in the field of education. So Vaikus Aminotid is a grassroots initiative uh, that forms in the late uh, 2014 after many people who were involved in education innovation had noticed a big puzzle missing in our education system. And uh, Nell Jung, one of the founders, uh, was actually a contributor to the Estonian Lifelong Learning Strategy 2020 uh, during that time. And this uh, document, Eesti Elugustva Õppe Strategia, uh, guides the most important developments and funding decisions in Estonia between 2014 and 2020. And um, this forward-looking paper introduced the concept uh, or a change in uh, approach to learning. Well, it's, it's, it's really profound paper and, and it goes far beyond than, um, an, a normal idea of what the teacher does. And it describes one of the uh, desired strategic changes as follows. The learner... Um, the learner as a uh, self-regulating and independent member of society who is ready and able to define one, one's needs and goals, choose well-considered ways for achieving these goals and be responsible for one's actions and choices. I mean, this is a, just um, the best citizen or best uh, person you can hope for. Um, however, in 2014 there were no practical tools and little experience in education system to make this vision real. And uh, the status quo responds to a growing complexity in the world by curriculum designers has been repeated education reforms uh, with the thankworthy intent to integrate these subjects and connect learning outcomes. But the results have been worrisomely low uh, levels of uh, learning joy in schools, overworked and often stressed out teachers. And uh, in some aspects, the reforms are not working. Uh, and I think because we were dealing with the symptoms of the problem and not the root of it. According to the recent research, self-regulation skills such as grit, the ability to focus, and emotional regulation are fundamental for human well-being. Not the IQ, not the volume of information you have between your ears, <coughs> but um, emotional regulation <coughs> and the ability to focus are these kind of fundamental um, components that are necessary. <clears throat> so the team's own experience in mindfulness and of course uh, decades worth of pioneering work in education all over the world, including the United Kingdom, have convinced us that the fundamental missing piece in education is precisely self-regulation and mindfulness skills. And designing but the, uh, education is, is not an easy task. And it's quite clear by now that no one has a clue uh, what the job market will be in 20 years. 
and yet we do our best to teach kids for that future. Um, but the only certain thing about the future would be the change. So considering the emergence of artificial intelligence and development of robotics, uh, the change could be quite drastic. So why don't we cultivate mental flexibility, resilience and focus in addition to the standard learning outcomes which has guaranteed us a very good scores at the PISA tests? So that's what we did. Uh, we used research-backed knowledge and tools of mindfulness practices and we de designed a basic training program for teachers while training our own instructors at the same time. Now we've been testing this um, curricula for over two years and also run a pilot test on it. Um, we also decided early on to take a systemic approach to development uh, that could be scalable to whole Estonian educational system. Because as a service designer, I myself was very aware that in education you have a lot of people coming with a lot of very good ideas that are granular and, and are ending up being noise for, um, for a school principal. But how do I decide the best one? Everybody has a point, everybody's selling their own idea. But we try to take very systemic view. So, three and a half years later, with a little help of an unfortunate attention crisis uh, in homes and schools brought to us by mobile phones and, mobile phones and smart devices, we have become a well-recognized and established training program. With about 15 instruction, uh, instructors, we have trained uh, about 7% of all Estonian teachers from preschool to secondary education. That's over 1,500 people, and there are many still uh, to be, uh, to, who are in training. And with open training, uh, that is kind of that everybody can come, the reach is even higher. Over 25% of all institutions in this segment are covered by at least kind of one teacher uh, who has had our training. Uh, moreover, we have reached almost 10% of all basic and secondary education institutions with in-house training. These are schools that actually kind of want to um, take uh, this curricula to whole, uh, the, the whole school and the, the whole of their teachers. And our next step would be bring these kid-safe mindfulness practices to parents and adults uh, through businesses. Uh, similarly, to, make a, to have a greater mass effect. Uh, and we also launched, launched a uh, handy smartphone app uh, last autumn uh, with basic audio guides uh, to start the training. Um, and we're planning to develop new tools for this platform because if you can't win them, jo join them, basically. We think that you know, the tools itself um, must be, we need to learn how to use these tools that steal our attention. And it is doable. But the most important development for us uh, is um, the next few years, uh, an extensive research project we are running. And um, I actually like to give a big applause to our partner, Estonian uh, Ministry of Education and Research, who has been involved uh, and generous to fund uh, the research and program uh, for, of our inter intervention. They deserve it. Yeah, thank you. Applause, Leo Aisale. Applause. Our hope is to become internationally recognized uh, evidence based program um, by Blueprint Standard, and uh, this will allow us to offer. Uh, program also to neighboring countries because every or the most of the um, education systems are um, um, are expected to use evidence-based programs and, and this is I think very good use for uh, public money. Uh, the research conducted by University of Tartu <coughs> excuse me, 
and the international team will look at uh, more than 1,000 students uh, in 8th and ninth grade. We picked the toughest group. And it also includes a novel biomarker stu study. Study this large uh, are not only contrib contributing to the quality of education in Estonia, but uh, this will enrich the global landscape of education innovation and uh, will give valuable input for all other mindfulness programs. Because it's really hard to run these uh, attention and um, resilience uh, uh, tests on, on kids. And uh, the, the, the big part of there would be actually the, these caring principles of these research schools that are actually enabling during the year to send all the teachers off to some sort of weird testing and uh, allow us to come there and, and uh, split half of their students so that one will be in control group, another will be the active tests. So very quickly, Tabasalo Yhis Gymnasium, Tallinna Järveotsa Gymnasium, Audentas Eragool, Loo Keskool, Põlvakool, Paide Gymnasium, Rõuge Põhikool, Tartu Karlava Kool, Nissi Põhikool, Ruila Põhikool, Äsme Põhikool, Kose Gymnasium, Laulasma Kool, kelle direktor peaks siin olema, You Rock, uh, the school knowledge of uh, municipality should be really proud because uh, these schools and these uh, principals are really kind of forward-looking and, and want to take good care of, of their children and um, teachers as well. <laughs> yes. And in, in conclusion, I'd like to thank all the teachers in Estonia whose support has inspired us to take this mission further and to share here our progress uh, so it might inspire other areas of governance. I, I know that Chris and Jamie will inspire uh, a lot of you to take action and Vaikus uh, and with our partners are ready to cooperate to make Estonia a mindful nation uh, with a lot of uh, flourishing individuals. So, thank you. So thanks a lot, Janus. And um, I have to say also hello to our viewers on the internet, because some people who are not able to be with us here today are, we are having a live stream and we are also recording it and we are putting an Estonian translation on this, uh, recording, uh, on this recording later, so it will be available to everyone who, um, who also don't speak English. And I wanted to stress as well that we, are fo we have focused uh, very much, Janus and me, on, on the kids and, um, and on the educational system. But obviously mindfulness has its benefits in many, very many fields. Uh, Chris and Jamie will probably touch upon the things about uh, mental health, about rehabilitation of prisoners, for example and also about businesses and there is one uh, thing that I have thought about a lot also sitting in the parliament how can you actually want to lead other people if you cannot lead yourself I think that's that's where it all starts and I wanted to also tell you that you will be able to have uh, from the audience questions to our guests so do think about this and when they have given their presentations we will have um, we will have time for questions. And now it's my great honor to present uh, Jamie Bristow, the leader of the Mindfulness Initiative. Welcome, Jamie. Good morning, everybody. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, I recognize that when you're listening in a, in a, a second language, it takes extra attention. Um, and uh, uh, yes, we'll, we'll try and uh, keep, it, keep it so simple. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to first introduce what mindfulness is. Chris is then going to talk about mindfulness in politics, in, in Parliament in the UK and around the world. Uh, and then uh, I am going to lead us in a bit of practice, actually trying out a little bit of mindfulness before I talk a little bit more in detail about how mindfulness can be used in public life.
across different areas of society. But first of all, I'd like to just get started with, with a show of hands, if that's okay, and get you into the, into the room. Could you put your hand up if you ha know something about mindfulness, maybe you read about it? And, okay, so maybe that's two, two thirds of people, something, something like that, three quarters, great. Uh, and that's probably in the last few years, right? Like, it's quite a new thing. Uh, in the UK, at least, uh, you know, a very small number of people had heard of mindfulness five years ago, five, six years ago. Uh, and now it's most people. We have, um, like, a surveys that show that most people have, have at least heard the word. So hands up if you've practiced mindfulness and you had a little bit of a taste of it. Okay, a few less, so maybe about, uh, uh, about half. So uh, when you ask people, okay, who... Um, Actually, because a lot of you practice it, you kind of know what, what's going on. But when you speak to an audience who don't know about it, who haven't practiced it, and you ask them to associate it with things, often it's like candles, sitting cross-legged, bells, um, Buddhists maybe. Uh, and that's natural because that's, uh, that's what the associations have been for, 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 a long, for a long time. But I'm here to tell you that mindfulness, the word mindfulness is used for very different things. It's a, it's a course you go on, it's a kind of way of life, or um, it often has a capital M, mindfulness. Uh, and uh, I, the, the best way perhaps to understand it is as a natural, innate human capacity. So we all can be mindful, somewhat mindful, some of the time, even if we've never heard of the word. And a researcher can give you a questionnaire and, and tell you how mindful they think you are, uh, even if you've never practiced it. And it turns out that people who are more mindful, more of the time, tend to be better, uh, res more resilient to psychological distress, have better, more satisfying relationships, and be better decision makers. So this is before we're even practicing it, there is an association there. Uh, and so these, this uh, natural state of mind, which I'll explain in a minute, um, is, uh, can be cultivated. So we can go from having low levels of mindfulness to high levels of mindfulness uh, throughout the day, throughout our life, by practice. So what is it? Well, uh, most succinct way I like to put it is it's, uh, it's the ability to know what's going on in our minds without necessarily getting carried away by it. The ability to know what's going on in our minds without necessarily getting carried away by it. And by example, for instance, if we're driving through traffic and someone cuts, us, cuts, us, cuts in, and uh, a natural reaction is to get angry, uh, to get ticked off. And uh, we're, uh, without, sort of, uh, without mindfulness, we tend to, we're in the, mind, we're in the anger. We are angry. But with, uh, with mindfulness on board, we, uh, we can perceive that anger. So, so we, are, we can feel the buzzing in the chest, the ears getting hot, the stream of sort of angry, self-righteous thoughts streaming past. And because we're observing the anger, we're not getting carried away by it. We are not sort of uh, lost in it. And so this uh, is often described as sort of uh, meta-awareness or... Um, like more perspective, basically. So it's the, the capacity to know what's going on in your mind, but also, when I say mind, I also mean the body. Because scientists are starting to, to, to realize that the, the mind isn't separated from the body, despite the fact that, um, as, uh, as the educationalist Ken Robinson says, we tend to treat the body as a vehicle to get, us from, um, to get our minds from meeting to meeting, rather than actually a... Uh, a decision a decision making thinking feeling integrated whole so mindfulness helps us not just to know what's going on in the mind but also what's going on in the body and uh, that helps us to with our intuition with our decision making it helps us to perceive and regulate our emotions better uh, and it gives us sort of more information to to um, to, to go on so it's um, what's going on in our mind and our, and our body, but also um, uh, the world around us. Because um, we, t we have sort of two different modes of mind. One is, uh, cognitive scientists think, is, is, is associated with the narrative, uh, sort of abstract mode of processing. Uh, so uh, thinking about stuff, and you're not really realizing where you are, you're kind of in the future, you're in the past, um, 
And that's very helpful. It's good that we have abstract thought and we can think about things that are going to happen and we can plan. But there's, an, there's another mode of mind, direct experiencing. What's going on right here, this person in front of me, in my child's face. And that mode of mind in our society uh, is uh, underdeveloped, underprioritized. And we haven't got the skills, generally, to, 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 to choose where to... Um, to be present when it's really important to be present. So recognizing when we're in the narrative with our mind full, and when we're in the direct experience, and we're here in the park enjoying the day or listening to someone deeply, we need to have the choice to be, be in that mode or that mode. Both are good, but you need the choice. So mindfulness is the ability to have that choice and to be more in the direct experience. So what's happening when, uh, when you're in the narrative mode and you're going through life? Well, you, you, you are on autopilot. Because if, whilst you're thinking about the future and, and, and the past, um, you're still probably driving to work or you're sort of half listening to somebody whilst you're also thinking about something else. Uh, or you're brushing your teeth or you're making a cup of tea or you're walking in the park. And so things that you've done multiple times... We, we have a part of our brain called the cerebellum which is very good at making them automatic. And so we go through life like, like a zombie, zombie almost, on autopilot, uh, whilst we're thinking about other things. Now, that's helpful, because otherwise we wouldn't get through the world um, and it would be exhausting without autopilot to do everything as if it was the first time. However, when the world changes or when someone, something really needs your attention, the autopilot is still going. And we're not noticing that the world has changed. There's new information to learn from. This situation needs me to respond differently from how I responded in the past. But with autopilot, you don't recognize that. You just go through with the same habits and the same impulses that you've always had. So with mindfulness, the choice to, to switch out of the autopilot and more into the direct experience means we can learn from the world when it changes and when it requires us to have a different relationship, a more creative, more responsive relationship, rather than reacting on impulse um, and, uh, and habit. So uh, scientists can put this in brain scans and show when we're in these different modes. The mode of meta-awareness, where we're holding this all in direct experience, or the, or the, or the mode that's narrative, where we're just kind of, you know, we're, we're lost and we don't really know what's, how much time has elapsed or where, you know, what's going on. Um, and, as I mentioned, I think modern society, as, as both Yoko and uh, Yanis alluded to, uh, mentioned, uh, modern society is making us more narrative and more abstract because there's so much we have to do. Manage our own brand, um, you know, wor worry about all these competing demands. Uh, and, and so, uh, in modern society, compared to, say, the caveman, <laughs> uh, we have uh, lots of abstract things to worry about. So a caveman had lions, saber-toothed tigers, bears, and when they were a threat, uh, the immune system, not the immune system, sorry, the nervous system has a way of dealing with that. So there's a, this little part of the brain, the size of the peanut in there, is responsible for a lot of problems. Uh, it's, called the, it's called the amygdala, and it, um, it responds to threat by pumping out cortisol, raising our blood pressure, raising our heart rate, making us tense because it's time to fight or it's time to run away. And when it's lions and tigers and bears, oh my, that's, that's, a, success, that's a, a good way of responding. And in fact, in modern society, sometimes it's a good way of responding too. However, when the caveman uh, managed to run away from the tiger and went back, and, and back to the campfire and he had a massage and they you know, sang songs and um, told stories about the, you know, the big tiger... Um, then it's a relaxing time and you have a different part of your nervous system called the sympathetic, ner parasympathetic nervous system that calms you down. Um, whereas we can't run away from our tigers and our bears in our society now because particularly when you're, if you're a young kid and you're being bullied, you go home, it's on Facebook, it's on Snapchat, it's on Instagram. Um, that's, a, that's a really obvious example. But even when you're an adult and you know you're, you're the thing about tomorrow or the boss or whatever, your tiger is still there. There's still things you can be doing. Um, and so that amygdala doesn't ever calm down. In fact, it grows in physical size and it emits more and more chemicals. And that is 
very, a big problem for your long-term health. It can make, it make you die earlier, quite simply, but also it can make you a poorer decision maker, worse, worse at making decisions. So, um, so with mindfulness training, uh, it's been found, I'll just skip ahead here actually, and come back. With mindfulness training, it's been found that the amygdala shrinks, the activity shrinks, the amygdala shrinks, and the left prefrontal cortex, which is more about the kind of higher order thought pro thoughts and putting things in perspective, and uh, that grows and, and it gets thicker. So, you know, the science of, of the brain and science of, uh, and neuroscience is very young, it's very early. Uh, and, and particularly, this, you know, the neuroscience of mindfulness is very young. But we think this is, you know, this is um, this is what's happening. So the brain changes in just eight weeks of mindfulness practice. So uh, that's just one of the studies. Um, there's there's sort of thousands of, of, of studies now, uh, and there is about 700 a year. So sort of two academic papers per day. And now coming out on this subject, so you know, even me who works in this field just can't even read all the titles of all the papers. Like it's just, I used to read all the papers, and then I read the abstracts, and then I read the titles, and now I'm just like, someone else, someone else can do that and tell me what's important. Um, and uh, and so, what's the evidence base showing? Well, it is, um, it's showing that uh, uh, there are improvements in in cognitive skills, so so working memory. Uh, our ability to hold things in our mind as we're kind of thinking about them. Uh, decision making. So particularly being aware of the ways in which we are biased, the ways in which we make bad decisions predictably as humans, because all humans have, have shortcuts in our brain to make it easier for us to make decisions, but those shortcuts are sometimes just wrong. If we're more aware of those some, um, through mindfulness, it looks like we might be able to avoid them. And so self-regulation. So dealing with emotions, uh, dealing with attention, uh, empathy and compassion. So feeling the, the emotions of another person, and also f like wanting to wanting to do something about that. Little interesting thing about that is that it's one of the ways that happens is is, is um, body awareness. So simply by being aware of the body, seems to make us more empath empathic, because it's like the body knows the body is responding to someone in distress. But if we're not listening to the body, we, we, don't, uh, we don't get that message. I mean, that might be how it, how it works. It's early days. And then the things you might be, might be familiar with, lower stress, lower anxiety and depression, uh, dealing with pain, long-term health conditions, and uh, addiction, and breaking bad habits. Because I mentioned before about how we, we can consciously interrupt habit patterns if we uh, bring awareness to them. So I just want to say that it's, well, there are thousands of papers. Most of the papers are from studies that are very small, that are poorly funded, and don't have adequate control. Or um, uh, yes, yeah, so, but this is this is this is normal for an early young field. So there are only a few areas where the evidence is very good, very strong, and that is depression, anxiety, pain, particularly in the, in the health area. Things are getting better in education in in. Um, uh, long-term health conditions, in uh, attention, memory, that kind of thing, but it's still very early, so I don't, we can't make any promises uh, here, um, apart from in, in clinical evidence. But there, you know, there are hundreds of people around the world working very hard to change that. So uh, how, how do you train in mindfulness? Well, most of the evidence base, there's thousands of research papers, are from eight-week courses. So it's been used in uh, medical hospitals since the 1970s, so for over 30 years. Uh, uh, something called mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, MBCT, which involve uh, meeting once a week for eight weeks for normally two hours each time, and then having home practice. So the clinical example is 45 minutes every day of, of mindfulness practice. But of course, not everyone can do that, and so there are apps uh, you know, which teach you in 10 minutes a day, and in the workplace, in schools, there are many different adaptations which make it much shorter, but the evidence is with the eight-week course. So anything that is different from that is probably good, um, but is you know, unproven. So we need to make sure we get the right balance between what's proven and what is uh, appropriate for the workplace or for uh, other examples. So here we have, um, yeah, we have 
uh, Headspace, the app there, um, 25 million users or something now. I, I worked for them for a couple of years, and it's definitely a good way. You can do first 10 days for free, headspace.com. There's also will.com, W-H-I-L, uh, and there's Buddhify as well, which is um, three uh, that I know about personally. So that's a little bit about mindfulness. Happy to take um, some questions later on when we try and do some practice. Before we get into like a little bit of a taste, I'll, I'll take your questions about that, so have a think. But before we do that, and ha we will hear from Chris and uh, the incredible work that he's been doing um, to, yeah, he's a, uh, a one-man whirlwind who's been spreading mindfulness in the political uh, class around the world. So thanks, Chris. Thanks for that, Jamie. Uh, as Jamie has said, and Yoko before him, uh, I'm a member of the British Parliament. Uh, I was, before I was elected in 1997, I was a school teacher for 15 years, and then an MP for 18 years, and then I lost in 2015. So I was out of Parliament for two years, and now uh, I've been back for the past year. I'm a Labour politician, Socialist Party, uh, but we've taken uh, mindfulness forward uh, on a cross-party basis in the United Kingdom. When I was a teacher, in 1987, the school was being inspected by Her Majesty's Inspectorate, and the staff got the jitters. So the head teacher called in the school nurse to, uh, to calm us down. And she used, not mindfulness, but medita just meditation. We hadn't heard of mindfulness. So we lay down on the school gym, and it was the whole school, it was the janitor, the cooks, the teachers, the head teachers, the deputy head. <coughs> and we lay down, and we did the tension and release throughout the body to calm us down. Uh, and we did breathing. And it benefited me so much that I decided to take it to the school children in my class. And in those days, the classes were big. There were 39 children in my class. Uh, they would have been eight and nine years of age. And it was a Catholic school. It was the same school I went to when I was three. <laughs> and uh, I used it in many different lessons. I used it in creative writing, uh, in religious education, in storytelling. I used it in, uh, in physical education for gym or football. At the end, we would, they would lie the children down and I would take them through this tension and release, and then they would walk home like this, and their parents would be outside, and they'd say, what have you done to my child? This is marvellous. <laughs> uh, I used it in, in, in storytelling, uh, I, uh, uh, and I put some visualisation on it. So it was a Catholic school. The junior department had 300 children. They would all be in a big hall like this, and I would get them to, to breathe and to slow down, and to close their eyes, and then I would say, give them a story from the Bible, the Lake of Galilee. I would ask them to feel their, their feet in the hot sand, to listen to the, 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 the uh, sails flapping in the wind, to feel the coolness of the lake, and then I would tell the story, put them in the setting, and then tell the story. And the responses I got back from the children were great, uh, because they were in the story. I would also uh, use it uh, for, for discipline. I know <laughs> perhaps you shouldn't use mindfulness in such a utilitarian way. But during the 15-minute break in the morning, uh, if it had been wet and windy, the children would come in and they would be wet and windy. And I would use just one or two minutes as moments of stillness and silence just to, to calm them down and to improve their focus and attention. So that was in the 1980s. I didn't come across mindfulness until uh, about uh, 11, uh, 11 years ago. Uh, my daughter, who was then 12, she's 23 now, was doing comparative religions. And I came across Buddhism. I thought I knew a bit about Buddhism. I didn't realize the centrality of the meditation in Buddhism. So I started to download a, a few uh, podcasts in those days, 11 years ago, and then a few more, and then a few more. And in the end, I had 300 podcasts from Gil Frodensdall from Spirit Rock in, uh, in California. And I would play these uh, podcasts on the way down to Parliament, uh, 
that, that would be the theory of mindfulness and the discussions and the Dharma talks. I wouldn't do the meditation, otherwise I would be dead driving down to London. So I got heavily into this and practiced the meditation for about five years. And I'm not sure if you recall, in 2009, in the British Parliament, there was the expenses crisis and uh, MPs had been caught with a hand in the till. They thought the change would do them good. And <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> many were stressed, the whole institution was stressed. So I, um, I, I used it to, to calm me down in that period. Um, and in 2012, I decided to take mindfulness to the British Parliament. Uh, how do I get into the arrow? The arrow. arrow down. I decided, so that's my backstory and introduction uh, into mindfulness, my personal route into mindfulness. Uh, and I decided to take mindfulness to the British Parliament. And I, I wasn't well connected in the well-being world. So I approached Professor Richard Layard, who was a Labour Lord in the House of Lords. We have the House of Commons, which is elected, and the House of Lords, which is appointed. So I approached Professor Richard Layard, and he was a professor in the London School of Economics. For 40 years, he was an economics professor, and then he widened that into health economics and well-being and mental health. And he wrote the book, The Good Childhood, he also wrote the book, Happiness, A New Science. Uh, he also founded Action for Happiness, how to, uh, which has been established in cities and towns throughout the United Kingdom and beyond, on practical ideas on how to create happy individuals, happy groups, and happy societies. So I knew he was well-connected, and I approached Richard in June 2012, and he approached Professor Mark Williams from the uh, Oxford Mindfulness Center. There's the OMC uh, there, um, who Mark Williams was the professor who, along with Zindel Ziegel from Toronto and uh, John Teasdale from Cambridge University, who proved the science behind mindfulness for repeat episode depression. And this was accepted by the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in 2004 uh, in, in the UK. And NICE, this National Institute, they look at all medicines and all interventions in the health service and they scrutinised the science behind them and they accepted it in 2004. They looked again in 2007 and again in 2009 and the science was still bearing up. So he was one of the uh, leading scientists in the whole of the world, uh, definitely the leading scientist in the United Kingdom, and he was the person that we approached to come and give mindfulness lessons in Parliament. And he brought along with him Chris Cullen, uh, a lovely man who is, has been our teacher for the, five, uh, for the last five years. Mark introduced the lessons, uh, but Chris took over. Chris took up the baton. And um, the book, the course that we followed was MBCT, Mindfulness Based Cognitive Therapy. And it was Mark Williams' book. Uh, it's a bestseller. We've calculated that every 20th house in the United Kingdom has a copy of this book. And it's mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, cognition and recognition on, uh, on how to learn different strategies to cope with the stress that affects us in modern life. Uh, we modified the course from a two-and-a-half-hour course to a one-and-a-quarter-hour course on a Tuesday night. The last vote in Parliament was at seven. So at quarter past seven, we started the lesson, and at half past eight, we finished it. We continued it for eight weeks, and we followed uh, each week, we followed, followed uh, different practices in there, as well as the, the breathing. And Mark had a lovely way of explaining the breathing techniques for mindfulness. He used his arms and his, and, and his hands, and he said that uh, if this is your body and this is your mind, the best place to be is your mind and body in the same plane at the same time so that your mind is taking in whatever is before you. But many people lead their lives like this. Their body's in the present moment, but their mind is drawn back. And they not only lead, uh, uh, lead their life like that, but their mind is ruminating. And it's going over and over and over the same old thing, dragging them back away 
from what they should be concentrating on. Some people lead their life like this, their body in the present moment, but their mind planning, where should I be next? What will I be doing in five years, ten years' time? Uh, and some people actually walk like that. <laughs> they walk to their next meeting, you know, missing everything that was before them on the way to that meeting. It was lovely to hear the ambassador saying that she wasn't going to get in her car. She was going to walk back to the embassy, only 300 metres, and experience the sunshine, her feet on the floor, and everything around her. So Mark said you can use the breath to bring you back to the present moment so that whatever is before you, whether it be a sunset or a sunny day or your uh, baby's face or your, your partner, that you are fully present for them, that you're not missing out. Um, so that, that was the way that he, uh, uh, he explained it and the breath and sitting and meditating and doing body scans was all part of uh, our course over that eight weeks. But we also le le learned di different uh, ways to perceive, to frame and reframe the world around us. And one of those was uh, to be grateful, and we keep a gratitude diary. Chris Cullen, our teacher, uh, every lesson that we have in Parliament now starts um, with us listing five things that we're grateful for. And usually there's a little quote from Rumi, or somebody at the bottom to inspire us. Five things that we're grateful for. And at the end of the lesson, it's like a bookend, we will be asked to dwell on one of those five things and to feel in the body where that gratitude is. And, when, uh, and so I've been keeping uh, a gratitude diary now uh, for five or six years. Um, and it is transformative. I used to fill in it every single day. Now it's about twice a week. And if you can get your gratitude from a wide range of places, not your material things, oh, I love my clothes. You know, you can love your clothes. I like my big heavy watch. I like my gold pen. But it's not those material possessions that bring you true happiness. Um, so if you can widen the range of your gratitude to include the natural world, to include uh, you know, lights and shade uh, and... Uh, the wind in the trees and flowers, and it sounds a bit airy-fairy, and quite often people who say it's airy-fairy is because th those are the ones that miss it. Their vision is this narrow. They miss the wider perspective. So gratitude for the natural world, and gratitude for our health. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've got two eyes, I can walk. And just imagine it for one day, if you were blind, how you'd be devastated by that. So be grateful for what you've got. So gratitude uh, for the built environment in London, our tube system, our public public transport system, uh, it, 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 it is worth being grateful for. So gratitude is, is key. Um, also, we, uh, we looked at habits, and uh, Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. And some of those things, as Jamie has said, uh, that, that those habits are necessary, but quite often they take us in the wrong direction for a long time, and we never question them. But if you can question your small habits, and one of the uh, lessons that we did was to, to, to pick something small in your life and give it up for a week or change or alter that habit. And for me, it was caffeine. I, uh, I drink a lot of tea. I drink one and a half litres of tea before I leave the house in the morning. And, uh, and you too. <laughs> uh, so uh, I was pretty wired in the mornings. Uh, so I, uh, I, I dropped the caffeine and I had headaches for two or three days. But then after a, a week, I thought, this is good. So my preferred choice now is decaffeinated tea. I gave up chocolate for a week and then a month. And for the past five years, I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, eaten chocolate. I've changed my route to work. Instead of going the direct route, I now walk along the banks of the River Thames on the other side or through St. James's Garden, past Buckingham Palace. It may take me twice as long, but I enjoy it and I notice it. So breaking your habits is a key thing. Um, and then um, stillness. And it was lovely to hear Janus talk two or three years back over a Skype about moments of stillness, moments of quiet. And there's a quote from Blair, uh, Blair Pascal up there. All human evil comes from a single cause, man's inability to sit still in a room. And you can probably see by my gesticulations, I am a naturally 
uh, a person who does lots of movement, who, uh, uh, who is a very physical person. And for me, th that gift, just to sit still for five, ten minutes a day, um, is, is, is uh, very important. So how, how long have we got, sir? Yeah. Well, I thought it was 45. All right. <laughs> uh, Okay, um, so I'm, 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 uh, as Jamie said, I better move on from there. Can I just mention a c couple of others? Uh, we, we learnt about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the spiral of decline, that we may have uh, activities that uh, uh, nourish us and activities that deplete us. And that in a time of crisis, we throw out the activities that nourish us and we take on the activities that deplete us. So that takes us down in the spiral. And then uh, we become more stressed, so we throw out these nourishing activities until we have a breakdown. So to, we had lists of things that nourished us, lists of things that depleted us, and we, um, and we made sure that we kept that list in check, that balance in check. Um, so after this, uh, the, the uh, MPs that had been on the course, they were asked, what did they get out of it personally? And these, uh, this is a, a lovely man, Al Lord Alan Howarth. Uh, he used to be conservative. He came to Labour. He's a very gentle, kind man. And he got focus, energy, perspective, and balance. Uh, Nick Dakin, a working class uh, man from, you can see by the, the chimneys behind him, from an industrial area, uh, a strong Labour area. Uh, he said it was transformative. These were gifts of the mind, the gifts of gratitude, of stillness, of breaking habits. Um, so we had these personal, uh, 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 we, we felt that we'd benefited per personally from this, so we asked some of the MPs, would they like to turn their personal uh, into the political? And Gandhi said, you must be uh, the change you wish to see. And many of those MPs wanted to get involved in the pol policy side. And there was reasons for this because the statistics that are coming out from international bodies like the World Health Organization, you know, the predictions are there. Well, not even the predictions, the actual current moment, uh, depression is one of the biggest uh, health burdens in the world. By 2030, it will be the biggest. That's just depression. There's a whole range of other mental uh, illnesses, but just depression is, uh, is uh, likely uh, by 2030 to be the biggest, um, the, the biggest burden in the world. And politicians have recognized this. Politicians from the left and the right have recognized this. And they provided the backdrop in the late noughties and the, uh, uh, around 2010. Uh, Sarkozy from France and David Cameron from Britain, the United Kingdom, they wanted to measure well-being. They said that the measurement of a country's success as only GDP wasn't enough. And as I say, these are on the right. So they've introduced a measurement of uh, well-being in, uh, in France and the United Kingdom, and they are used now, those indicators, I think there's 41 in the United Kingdom, are used to help develop policy. So that was the, the backdrop for our initiative. We decided that we would uh, have a Mindful Nation inquiry. Uh, this was the book, uh, that, that, uh, uh, our inquiry. And we looked into the area of criminal justice, of... Um, of schools and education, of the workplace, and in the National Health Service. Uh, the, we took evidence from 80 people in eight sessions. Uh, we held these in, uh, in oak panelled rooms, uh, select committee rooms in the House of Commons, uh, from 80 people. Uh, in, within the book, at the back of the book, there are 220 references now, this is available online, and it's even better online because the references have got hyperlinks, so it gives you the science behind every point that is referenced. Um, so we took that evidence, and um, we, from, some, from, from some wonderful people, it was lovely to hear school children talking about the different parts of the brain. How many adults out there know about the amygdala? about the prefrontal cortex, about the difference between a reaction and a response. 
These young children, some of uh, these were uh, secondary school children from London. We brought down some primary school children from North Wales and to hear eight and nine year olds talk about the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex and know what's going on inside the home, uh, their own head was, was great. The chap up there on the right, Mark, he's a detective chief inspector of serious crimes in the UK in a highly stressed position uh, and he's taking a leading role within the police service in the United Kingdom. And again, industrial workers, this is not just for the captains of industry or the captains of the private sector or the public sector. These are for ordinary working people, uh, everybody in society. Um, we launched the, uh, the, the, our Mindful Nation report and uh, at that report we had five conservative ministers. So this was an initiative founded by two Labour politicians, a Lord and an MP, but on a cross-party basis, left and right united together, meditating in the same room and gathering evidence in the same room. And we had great buy-in from the Conservative uh, administration. The lady in the middle at the top is Tracy Crouch. I was the Labour co-chair. She was the Conservative co-chair. She, she went public about her depression. Uh, she went public in the chamber of the House of Commons, and she also so spoke about it on Radio 4. And a year later, she was appointed a minister, a minister for sport. So she wasn't punished. People didn't ridicule her or laugh at her. Some people, some MPs from, uh, have come to mindfulness from a position of instability. Some have come from a position of, of thriving, who want to thrive and flourish. Others have come to uh, mindfulness from a policy perspective. They were a, a health minister or a shadow minute health minister, and they wanted to know about, um, about how mindfulness could help them in a policy, in a policy way. So these different ministers, uh, the chap on the, on the right at the top is the mental health minister, Alistair Burt, a lovely man. The chap down here on the left is Tim Lawton. He is now the current conservative co-chair. And in the middle is uh, Professor Mark Williams, and on the right is a cabinet mem uh, minister. We have 22 cabinet ministers and then we have the prime minister. So this is the top ring of parliament, of government. And Nicky Morgan was the uh, uh, education minister who took on board our recommendations. Those are the recommendations which Jamie will talk about later. Uh, they were achievable. Uh, we believe that they were achievable asks from the government and progress has been made on those. Those are some of the... Uh, MPs that were involved and uh, the ladies in the centre from the Scottish Nationalist Party. Uh, the lady uh, uh, to the right uh, is Stephen Lawrence's mum. Her, her, her son was murdered in a racist attack. Um, uh, we have uh, Conservatives, SNP, Liberals, Labour. Those are, those are just some of the 186 members of Parliament who have had mindfulness training over the past five years and 500 members of their staff have had training and in a separate but parallel initiative 3,000 uh, senior civil servants have had, had mindfulness training from a wonderful woman called Marion Fur. So we have sprinkled the whole of the political decision-making process in London in Parliament with mindfulness and we hope that good things will grow from there. Uh, so some, uh, and as I say, when you sit in a room and you meditate with a, another MP, even if they're from the, a different party, even if before you didn't get on with them, when you sit and meditate, your heart does get affected by that. It's hard to be nasty to a person or personal or abusive to a person if you've sat and meditated with them. So these are some of the quotes that have been said, a foundational proposition. This is Professor uh, Ruth Lister, um, wonderful woman, uh, expert, world expert on poverty. She's in our group. And this is Tim Lawton. So we have, uh, we, we established uh, mindfulness in the British Parliament in 2013, but can I pay tribute to the work of your neighbours next door in the Swedish Parliament and Anne-Marie Broden? who started the first, we believe, the first uh, mindfulness parliamentary practice in the whole of the world in Sweden in 2011. And uh, Congressman Tim Ryan uh, started, we believe, the second on Capitol Hill in Washington in 2012. 
We were latecomers in 2013. But, so we were the third parliament to do this. And I thought uh, in 2014, I was asked to address the Google Wisdom 2.0 conference. This is where tech meets wisdom. And it was the first time it had met outside of the United Kingdom, uh, sorry, out the United States. And it was in Dublin, in, uh, in Google's headquarters. And I, I spoke there, and it was the first time actually I met Janus four years ago. And uh, there were 300 people there from 62 different countries. And at the end of that, people were saying, will you come to my country? Will you come to my country, my parliament? My parliament definitely needs it. And Yanis was one of the, uh, the people that asked me, and it's great to be here. Sorry, Yanis, about the delay four years later. <laughs> um, so we, uh, and uh, when those people approached me, 14, 15 different people, can you come to my parliament? I said, well, in, in six months' time, I will be involved in a general election. So I've, I, I've got to pace myself to make sure I don't overextend. So I, I visited the German parliament, the Dutch parliament, and the Welsh assembly, and tried to get uh, momentum going there to establish uh, uh, mindfulness in those parliaments. Unfortunately, despite the fact uh, um, I, I, I thought I'd pace myself correctly, I lost in 2015. And there's nothing as X as an XMP. One minute you have the position, you have headed note paper, you have uh, you're paid for it, you've got members of staff, uh, you can qu question uh, in Parliament orally or in written questions, you're on a select committee, you have this power and status and the ability to influence things, and the next thing, you're unemployed. <laughs> so it's, it's a big, big drop, and I'll come to it in my final slides. Um, so uh, during that time, as two years out, I thought, what shall I do with my time? I was very fortunate. I had paid a redundancy pay that could tide me over. Uh, so I, I, I felt that this was such important work that I went, uh, along with Jamie, we went out to see Congressman Tim Ryan in Washington, D.C., and he uh, shared our vision to try and have a global congress, a global conference of uh, politicians who practice mindfulness who could meet together uh, and to do, uh, see if we could progress policy. I visited the Australian Parliament in September 2015. That's a particularly fractious Parliament, um, and we're making progress there. Uh, the uh, National Assembly in France, I visit, visited there three times uh, in six months, and the ambassador there uh, allowed us to use his house. That's a picture on the, on, on the right up there. We, we found out in our research and in our travels that mindfulness was not just the preserve of the East or the, or, or the West, but there was interest within the Middle East. And I pay tribute to the, uh, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, they have appointed a female Minister of Happiness, Minister Raoumi, up there. And she, uh, she uh, got mindfulness into the Prime Minister of the UA UAE's um, office, uh, about 160 members of their staff, or his staff, were trained in mindfulness. Um, the Dutch Parliament, we made rapid progress there. I think it was something like 20 of their 120 MPs had mindfulness training within a six-month period, three cohorts. Um, I've been out uh, on Monday and Tuesday of this week to the Swedish Parliament, and we, we spoke there. Uh, this is Lottie, uh, a uh, Swedish MP, and myself at the, the speaker's podium. Uh, Jamie has been out to Sri Lanka uh, earlier in February. Uh, last year we met uh, one of the candidates for the position of the new head of the Interparliamentary Union. This is the club of democracies around the world. I think there's about 140 of them. And she ended up, and I spoke to her uh, just before the election, and she was successful, and she knew about mindfulness. So I've written to the, uh, the new chair of the Interparliamentary Union and asked her if she could convene an international conference on mindfulness. So there is an opportunity here to, to develop a, a network of politicians who practice mindfulness, who can be connected to each other, who can look at best policy, who can look at research and science and said, this has worked in our country. Would it work in your country? We can use this. You know, the pharmaceutical industry spends $20,000 million a year, $20 billion a year in government relations. 
Now, as Jamie, Jamie is the first ever director that's been paid, and he was only paid for two days a week, I think. It's one man and his dog. I volunteered for two years. Um, so what, but what, we, what we can have is a connected group of politicians who can look at the best practice, examine it, and if it suits their country, have it put into policy in their area. We convened a meeting, an international, the first international mindfulness meeting uh, in um, October of last year uh, in the House of Commons. So that's the terrace, the first uh, one up there is the terrace of the House of Commons. The speaker's quarters are down the bottom. Um, John Kabat-Zinn flew in to uh, address the conference. He was our guest speaker. We had no uh, Icelandic politicians. This is an Icelandic uh, female MP over here. Uh, we had representation from uh, Sri Lanka uh, and the lady up there is from Israel. Um, so, the, uh, again, uh, from Denmark, and there's John Kabat Zinn there speaking. There's Janus uh, from Sweden. It was a great conference, and uh, a lot of goodness has flowed and will flow uh, from there. This young lady here is from the Irish Parliament. Um, and we had uh, lots of speak, uh, speeches and lots of follow-up, and I think, Jamie, do you want to, how do, how do we play this? Uh, uh, oh, I think I've got it. Oh, no. Right, back. Okay, maybe. Um, who wants to give me a hand with this? Yeah, that's how do I get onto the desktop, because we haven't actually opened this up yet. It's just on the desktop now. Mm -hmm. It's just up here somewhere. <laughs> oh. There it is. It's a unique day. Never have so many parliamentarians from around the world come together in one place to talk about mindfulness and its role in politics and in um, society. This is a kind of conversation that's never really happened before on planet Earth, where scientists and politicians and meditators are all getting together to talk about the confluence of mindfulness and meditative awareness and compassion and kindness and wisdom with the work of governing. As the day has progressed, it's just been quite amazing because I don't think I'd really realized how important mindfulness was but now I kind of feel like it's the missing piece in a lot of things. If you cannot lead yourself, how can you lead someone else? And so cultivating intimacy with the present moment is not some kind of luxury, it's, I would say, an absolute necessity for living life fully and as if it really mattered and recruiting the full dimensionality of your being to it. Maybe to change the world, the best way is to give people the tools to be their best self. Does MECT work as a way of teaching the skills to stay well if they are very vulnerable to depression? The answer from 10 randomized control trials is compared to usual care, definitively yes. We have a lot to learn from UK with the mindfulness report and in how many different uh, fields of society mindfulness has been used. Someone spending 30 years of their life in custody costs the taxpayer a million pounds, that's one person. Mindfulness is a uniquely simple, powerful and scientifically mm -hmm. validated technique and we believe that it has to be placed at the heart of our reform. I was very inspired this afternoon by, for instance, uh, the man who had 30 years of prison behind him and said, I find my life back because of mindfulness. That was so touching, you know, listen to those people, how these techniques have changed, changed their lives in positive ways. But the, the health and wealth and flourishing of your nation and your children and your young people is something that should unite political parties and has united political parties. We have a lot in common that we can come together and try and look for new solutions and mindfulness is one of those new old solutions re reborn in a, in a modern um, context. So I think what it has done is it's given a new perspective to MPs 
I think it's calmed a few MPs down. That you know, there are many things that um, that unite us, as well as the things on policy that uh, divide us. And absolutely, be it Chris or other members from the Liberals or Labour Party or whatever, um, we all get on. I think a bit better because of this initiative. I think that any decision maker need to have a clear mind. And sometimes when when you are into this stressing environment and very aggressive environment, you end up losing the point, losing your clarity of views and doing stuff just because there's pressure. Being aware of your thoughts and emotions makes it also possible to reflect on them, therefore making better solutions. And mindfulness and meditation for me is really enabling me to stay in touch with what is more, most important to me, my own values, being able to let go of the stress. Uh, more clear-minded, hopefully better decision-making, creativeness. But also what I miss in politics in Finland and globally is kindness and heartfulness. I'm really pleased that actually mindfulness has now become something that we talk about as politicians uh, and how we deal with um, uh, all the pressures that we face um, and you know, how we spread that across um, the world. If we can move away from this very kind of cold individualism into politicians being more connected to the effect that their decision making is having, then we can work against that and become more compassionate. So I think that this is incredibly necessary for people who have a lot of power. When ethics comes into the picture, when doing the right thing comes into the picture, and self-interest that may not be in the larger interest, then this is truly a liberative practice. There needs to be some practical political outcomes from this uh, meeting here today. If you were to go back to your parliaments and just say, can we please have an, an, an analysis of this? So thank you very much. As we say in Wales, the Elkham Valley Act. It's a unique day. Never have so many parliamentarians from around the world come together in one place. Thanks, Mark. All right, let's finish this up. So, um, in conclusion, I, uh, I'd like to say, at the end of that clip, I said there needs to be some outcomes from our international meeting. And I think there needs to be some outcomes from this meeting here today. And I think there is an interest, genuine interest, be some, uh, with some of your parliamentarians to take, establish a mindfulness group within the Estonian parliament. And I know there's a definite interest amongst the advocates here in this room but what practical steps could you take? In his book, Tim Ryan's book, the congressman, Mindful Nation, he looks at mindfulness in education, in health, in criminal justice, and at the end of every chapter, there's recommendations for the individual reader to take. So if you're involved in a good project in the business world, and I've heard of a fantastic hotel chain this morning that's had all of their staff trained in mindfulness. If you're involved in a, an excellent initiative in the schools, which many of you are, then ask your member of parliament to come down and witness this. Ask them perhaps to meditate with a nine or ten year old. Uh, it can be life changing. Some of the MPs in the British parliament came to our mindfulness group because they were asked by a nine or ten year old. So make your politicians aware of uh, mindfulness. I'm sure uh, Janos and Yoko, and, uh, Jamie and myself can provide you with international and national statistics about the tsunami of mental ill health that is sweeping the world. But don't just pitch it at those who, who need the stability. It's about human flourishing. It's about living well, uh, lives with meaning and purpose, aware in the present moment. So uh, those are the reflections for yourself. Can I just finish on a story uh, my final story. When John Kabat-Zinn came over to the United Kingdom in 2013, he said, a word of advice to you, Chris, work on your parachute before you need to open it. I thought it was, a, and it stuck with me. Uh, in 2015, I told you I lost, I was out, on my backside, <laughs> and I got a lovely email from John, Chris, uh, how's it going? Sorry to see you've lost. So I said, uh, 
I uh, worked on my parachute, I opened my parachute, and it worked. So thank you very much. <laughs>
um, their own levels of mindfulness, and that could be quite different from reality. However, um, everything else that they measure, including you know um, biological things um, and depression and anxiety, that doesn't. Uh, they have other measures for that. So what's really important, actually, is that our lives get better in other ways rather than just this abstract idea of mindfulness goes up or something. So. Well, obviously, uh, just, to, just to point out that, like Janus also stressed, that we are uh, already now in Estonia, minutes of stillness are running tests together with the university on the children that are doing mindfulness, whether their levels of cortisol, this uh, stress hormone, basically, is somehow changing. So, so there are obviously things you, you, you do measure, as you mentioned, also the brain activities in, in your presentations. Uh, okay. It's complex. And, and I wanted to say also to Marco that uh, Jamie, in his uh, presentation after the uh, break, will talk more about policy uh, and also about uh, this institution that is the Mindfulness Initiative that brings together public sector, policy making, private sector, NGOs, which is one of the ideas I want to put forward in the end of this day, that what, what are the next steps that we will be uh, or we will think of, uh, of doing uh, here in Estonia. But now we will have a short break. We will start again uh, uh, 12 o'clock. And uh, please, some, uh, some refreshments, and uh, please be back at, at 12 o'clock. Uh, so uh, we have worked very hard to get the science and make it secular and make it accessible so that you don't need any kind of faith in order to understand this is a natural capacity and cultivate it. However, it's also very helpful for people who are religious, who are, um, uh, who are practicing. So imams, uh, so uh, Muslim religious leaders in Morocco have had mindfulness training as part of their, uh, part of their, um, their training. Uh, the leading figure in the UK, Professor Mark Williams, is also a Christian vicar. He's Reverend Mark Williams. A number of our most senior Christian leaders in the UK have spoken openly about how mindfulness is very helpful for, for their relationship with God and with their spiritual inquiry. So, uh, I, as for, and, and Hindus have mindfulness like, embedded within their stuff as well, and so it's similar to, to, to the Buddhists. So, uh, it, some people misunderstand it and... Uh, are, are, are resistant to it, that's for sure. If you look on the internet, some people will misunderstand it and will be resistant to it. But some Christian, I mean, some religious leaders will be very, very open to it. So it's a, it's a debate in each of those traditions. But what's, what's interesting is, is, is perhaps amongst that group that call themselves spiritual but not religious, which is like apparently now the majority of people in the UK. So what does that even mean? We don't actually know what that means. But people are wanting to ask the big questions about life. Who am I? What's this all about? How, what makes a good life? What makes a good person? How do I get, you know, um, where's, where's, where's value? Where's beauty? Where's meaning? And mindfulness practices, mindfulness communities, some people are using to ask those big questions. They're not being told what the answers are, but it's, for some people it's a spiritual thing. Um, and that's beautiful, I think. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to continue on the same topic. Um, along with the uh, growing uh, interest towards mindfulness, you also mentioned that there are people who are seeking for um, general answers in life. And I see that there is, um, um, uh, at least in Estonia, we have a strong interest towards um, alternative uh, spiritualism um, and esoterics. And I also see that sometimes when I try to uh, explain my good experiences with mindfulness to others, uh, they oppose or they distance themselves because uh, they don't make the difference between uh, this uh, esotericism and, and uh, mindfulness. How do you, do you see it as a problem? And how do you usually, what is your first step to overcome this? Yeah. Thank you. So, so yes, it's a, it's a, it's a barrier, because uh, people hear that word and they go, oh, yes, I know all about that. Mindfulness meditation, yeah, yeah, sure. It's, it's in that category of candles and cross legs and that kind of thing. So, so I know what that is, and I haven't got to ask you or, or listen to about what it is, because I know it. You know. Um, so, so what can we do to make them think again and challenge those assumptions? 
And, and so uh, companies like Headspace, who have the, you know, the app Headspace from headspace.com, their mission was very explicitly to rebrand meditation and, and help to challenge people's assumptions about it. Uh, so present it in a way. So, so what can you tell them which makes them, which surprises them? And goes like, oh, okay, well, that's not quite what I thought it was. So maybe I haven't got this entirely, you know, entirely right. And uh, one of those things is, for instance, you know, the, the, the U.S. Marines, you know, using mindfulness um, to help them, uh, to, yeah, to help them stay like, psychologically resilient in the face of high-stress situations. And by the way, on that point, it's more about when you don't like how not to fire your gun, and when not to fire your gun than it is about how you know, how accurately to fire it. So, um, so we don't want people sort of just reacting out of impulse and habit and, you know, doing what they shouldn't do. But if they're sort of calm and collected and they have that sort of um, good working memory in, in, in that context, then it's, it's better. That's a bit of a caveat. But, but yeah, so, so, you know, what are they interested in? Is it sport? Is it that kind of thing that would challenge their ideas, I think, is the important thing. I've got one down here. Just in case, I'll just start by saying that this is an actively participating Estonian uh, group. This is, th this is the way Estonians are. <laughs> so it's important <laughs> to tell for people who come from the UK to warn them in advance. I hope you were warned in advance. So, um, but you, you talked a lot about what's, what's been done and uh, what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, would you like to speculate or make some predictions or share some dreams of what might be coming because mm. you, as you pointed out you many times yourself and others have been uh, surprised by, by the progress and the, and the acceptance and the, the understanding. Yeah. So, so you know it's not my position I don't think to make too many claims um, about what's going on right now uh, but politicians are starting to say things which are quietly um, cautiously quite visionary and potentially really quite important. So in this world that seems to be increasingly polarized, seems to be extreme and, and you know, policy dialogue is happening at a shallow level because that's, you know, you know it's only the depth of a tweet uh, that, that things actually get, get through. There's evidence that politicians are saying, actually, this, this helps us. There's an affinity, there's a connection, as the conservative co-chair of the group says, between politicians who have been on a mindfulness course and a more considered approach to exchanges of differing views. So there are extreme differing views amongst those who practice mindfulness in the UK Parliament, particularly over Brexit. Tim Lawton, for instance, major campaigner, many at all for, for Brexit, many in, the, many in the group very, very much against it. Uh, but yet they're saying that they can speak a bit better about it. And one of the reasons, I think, is this meta-awareness that we're talking about. Rather than being so close to and identified with your views that you are your views, and you can't, see, you can't see them from the wood from the trees. Instead, you, you, sort of, you have this reflexive ability about thought, and therefore you take them less personally, and you can talk about your ideas from, you know, rather than attacking each other, because you, know, you are your ideas. Instead, you have this kind of, uh, yeah, I don't know, respect, potentially. I mean, that's what is reported in the workplace uh, more broadly. So... So in, in the political sphere, my, my big hope is that we get, you know, we've got 10% of politicians in the UK, roughly in terms of numbers, on the course. When that gets to a tipping point, 15, 20%, then you have a sizable minority which could shift the culture of policy making. So maybe 30 days, who knows? I mean, you know, that's my one, that's, that's, that's that one help. Uh, in, in public policy, you know, we think about physical things in terms of um, public health and amenities. So, you know, where is my school? Where is my daycare centre? Where is my, um, you know, hospital doctor, etc.? And as we discussed, policy making in general is becoming more psychological. Rather than building houses, building roads, building hospitals, we're thinking, where is the loneliness? Where is the trust? Where is, you know, where are these important fabric, bits of fabric in our society? So, where are the amenities that support that fabric? Is it access to a mindfulness training course? It doesn't have to be on your street corner. It can be online or it can be whatever. But that, you know, mindfulness or compassion training or like some of these other psychological capacities become the stuff of public amenity and almost right of access. So, well, yeah, 20 years' time, 30 years' time. But, but, you know, it's possible. I just have a short comment about uh, the father of mindfulness uh, 
uh, who coined the term John kabat said that uh, he's looking at it more as a kind of maybe 100 year or 1000 year uh, uh, perspective or program it's it's a uh, few years this it's nothing mm, yeah yeah indeed yeah all right i think we're uh, i think we're having to close the, yeah. the panel cool thank you everyone <laughs> you've been great Okay, so we have come to a part where we are having a short uh, panel discussion and we, are, we also have a new guest arrived, uh, Mr. Lauri Lugna, who is the deputy at the Minister of Interior Affairs in Estonia. And please, all the panelists, Janus, Chris, Jamie and Lauri. Mm -hmm. yes. Let's show people what's happening. Yes. So we can have, no, don't put them all in. Uh, we can have two at once, because uh, if everyone speaks at the same time, it's not very mindful. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, please, to start off, because Lauri has uh, just arrived, I would like to uh, give him a possibility to tell us a little bit uh, about his experience as, as the deputy in the, in the Ministry of uh, Interior Affairs, Sisa Ministerium Kansler. Uh, is there something going on in the field of uh, mindfulness within your uh, field of work? And uh, to, give, to give an overview and then, then we'll go further from there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really glad to uh, to be invited to this event, and I'm sorry that I wasn't able to um, to follow the the morning sessions. Uh, but um, it is uh, a bit of uh, hectic times in, in Estonian government at the moment because the the budget for the next years is is being prepared. And um, and uh, in addition, um, there is also a big big event going on on the issues of um, health and health. Uh, um, matters in the, in the Estonian public sector. But coming to the experience we've done in, in the Ministry of Interior is that um, we are of about uh, 200 employees in the Ministry of Interior. Um, our main task is around um, uh, developing the policy of uh, security and safety uh, for Estonia. Um, and uh, in our portfolio, we have also an um, uh, area of uh, which is called um, uh, citizens' affairs or uh, voluntary affairs um, um, uh, included. Um, but uh, about two and a half years ago, when I became the permanent secretary in the in the in the ministry, uh, my first goal was to, uh, to not to set. Uh, high missions and visions and and uh, goals, but to kind of look into deeper what is the organisation and and what we do. So about the culture and values, and and one of the things that uh, I uh, I encountered when uh, we did a survey about uh, people's uh, opinions and uh, and thoughts, what is what is good and what is not in the organisation, um, came out uh, an issue of. Um, Stress, uh, overwork, um, um, uh, hassle, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and and at some point, I kind of got an um, uh, idea. Uh, I can't recall from where, but uh, idea of inviting someone to speak about mindfulness. Uh, probably, I was going through literature at, at that time um, in in the internet and so on and so forth. So um, we invited um, to our um, uh, annual monthly event when we gather all the people from the organization into one, uh, one place and, and we bring in uh, people to talk of uh, different stuff. So 
about uh, a year ago, uh, we invited uh, Anni Kusik, uh, who has uh, done studies uh, and work in the uh, UK as well, in Oxford, um, to, to speak about mindfulness and, and to, uh, to give practical hints uh, to people uh, working in the ministry how to, um, how to uh, work with the issue of uh, being uh, in, a, in a stress uh, environment. And at that event, we also um, uh, shouted out the possibility to, um, to participate in a program uh, of um, about, uh, about uh, 10 uh, times. And 20% uh, of, uh, of employees uh, um, registered. Um, uh, attendance uh, rate was so-so. Uh, By end of day, 10% uh, 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 graduated. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, and uh, and uh, this uh, winter we uh, we uh, we did a follow up uh, session uh, as well, uh, and people were giving the experience what they've uh, felt and what difference it has made uh, to their work. And um, overall, I think we will will continue it because uh, of giving a possibility uh, of of att attending this course. Uh, because uh, the, the feedback we've, we've gotten is, is that uh, for many of them um, the, 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 there was a big shift uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the topic. So thanks a lot. I, I'm thinking uh, Chris uh, and Jamie, I've, uh, in the UK uh, you have also, um, we heard a story when we had the international event, uh, there was this um, a guy who looked like a true criminal, he had like uh, tattoos all over and looked really uh, scary and then he stood up and told his story how after 30 years in prison uh, when he got out he got uh, again this uh, his uh, probation officer told him that okay uh, you're going to go to this uh, mindfulness course as a part of your rehabilitation uh, program and he said oh yeah I have been to all sorts of these things and okay but okay I will go and look and uh, and he said that after the first uh, session which was uh, two hours of uh, practice and uh, and theory he uh, when he was uh, free and went home and uh, and slept it was the first night that he could sleep without thoughts and that uh, that was like the first step to getting his life back so, uh, so maybe uh, also you could t talk a little bit as we are. We have the Minister of uh, Interior Affairs, who are also uh, also touching the the same fields as as the Minister of Justice with this kind of uh, rehabilitation and uh, and the, and also the prison uh, world. Uh, what have been your experiences, and what have been the sort of specifics of how to get? Uh, you mentioned the Marines, how to get mindfulness into these really hard fields, somehow. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Yoko. And uh, thanks for all the good work that you're doing in your interior ministry. You seem like an enlightened person who's willing to uh, <laughs> ex ex uh, experiment or uh, look at best practice and, and, and try it out in your, own, uh, in your own ministry. And most importantly, to take feedback. Uh, on what you've introduced, so well done for that. <coughs> and I think, yes, uh, uh, the many people who attended our international conference um, last October were, were very touched, uh, and many were crying when they heard the, the, the plight of this, uh, this man who'd been uh, mentally tortured for 30 years and, uh, and had found a little bit of peace w w through mindfulness. He was one example. Another example in our uh, Mindful Nation report is another prisoner. Uh, and uh, I think his name was, was it Mark, uh, Jamie? And he told the story of how he, he was abused by his father mm -hmm. at the age of five. And he was tormented. And he lashed out when he became a, te uh, a teenager and ended up in jail. And he discovered uh, mindfulness. And it helped him become a better person. And now he's a father and... Uh, is looking after his little family, uh, using mindfulness to make sure he maintains that stability. So I, I think both stories illustrate the fact 
that you can have all the science in the world and all of the statistics in the world. But if you want to take policy forward, it's much more easy to do if you have a narrative, if you have individuals who have personally benefited from an intervention. And the graphic, the fact that you can recall this word for word uh, six months later after this speech is important. So I think if you do want to take mindfulness forward in your ministry, in your education department, and I spoke to a, uh, a person from the prison department, when you, when you pilot it in those different ministries, capture the, the impact that it has uh, on those individuals, as well as the statistics, because it's those personal stories that do chime with ministers, that do chime with policy makers. So it really is important to capture those personal perspectives. So uh, there is a great opportunity to, to teach prisoners, uh, ex-offenders, the, the skills they need to manage their own minds and impulses. So 80% of uh, offenders, uh, one Canadian study shows, have self-regulation difficulties. So they're just, they're just not able, like, no, like everybody else, to not do what their thoughts tell them to do, or what their habits or their natural instincts tell them to do. They just lash out, or they grab that thing, or whatever. And sometimes, actually, that's because that's their parents drank alcohol when, when, they were, when, when they were in the womb. There, there are things that really aren't, aren't their fault, um, and, and, and ways in which they're, they're, they're brought up. But that can change. So self-regulation can be taught. And that's one of the things which, which, which the prisoners we're talking about here um, uh, report as well as reducing depression, anxiety, and, and, and an assets of hopelessness. And some people say, like, I want them to be depressed, I want them to be anxious, I want them to be hopeless, because uh, they've done bad things. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. But, that, but those emotions are associated with reoffending and more costs, more social problems, more pain for society. So if we can, anything that we can use to, to reduce that trauma and difficulty inside their minds and stop it then being passed on to other generations and other people, we should do it. And so that, I mean, that's the basis of you know, re, um, rehabilitative, rehabilitative justice, sorry, restorative justice. Uh, and, and, and mindfulness should be one of the just many things that are being developed to help, um, to help prisoners understand their own, their own, uh, their own minds and, and to train them. But uh, you were also... Um Yesterday, when we were uh, preparing, you were talking about this, uh, uh, the problems within the police force, that uh, this is another very uh, uh, somehow s stressful working environment, and, uh, and how uh, if, if, if going towards these kind of very uh, specific professions with, uh, with mindfulness, for example, that, that, that it's important that it comes from someone who knows what their life is about. So maybe if you could elaborate a little bit about this theme, because we all, we politicians think we are really unique and the uh, police think they are really unique. And, and that's why maybe if, if Chris uh, started in the parliament, it was important that it was amongst the colleagues of the politicians and, and maybe to elaborate, because we are very fixed in these uh, roles that we that we live with. Y yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, so yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, and there are examples of prisoner, prisoners being taught to teach other prisoners. Uh, it's very hard to do that within a, a prison system. Like We're still working out what the best way of training is because some pr mo most prisons in the UK are in their cells for 23 out of 24 hours. And how you get different people from different cells together into a group and then get them to close their eyes together. You know, it's it's it's, uh, but 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 it does it does work, and there's been work over 20, 25 years to develop ways of doing it and to develop the evidence base. And one of those is exactly as you say, to to um, find people who who caught the bug and help them to share that bug with with their with their peers in in, in the system or having you know having come back in to help. So there's an example in a Kenyan prison. The Kenyan prison system is an unlikely uh, like it's, like one of the, it's one of the most exciting and, and well-developed mindfulness programs in, in a prison system, partly because they have such little, so little regulation <laughs> and sort of rules and structures that they can sort of experiment. But they have this thing called the Mindful Leader Program. 
And so these, these people have no identity apart from criminal and bad person. But instead, they've been given this, like, they practice mindfulness, they really get it, and they're given this identity of mindful leader to share with others. And, and that's what just caught on like, like total wildfire. And they have got very, very senior, I mean, the most senior prison officials saying this is a good thing, and then like, this grassroots movement among the prison population. Yeah, and uh, I, I think uh, one of the eighty, one of the eighty uh, people who gave evidence to our mindfulness, mindful nation report, uh, it was by chance. It was a professor Charles Halpern from Berkeley University in California. He was in Amsterdam, and he noticed that I'd been doing some work on mindfulness, and he said, "Can I come and see you?" Uh, and he came on the day that we were taking evidence on criminal justice. Uh, and he spoke at our uh, at our event, and he has set up a uh, a U.S. mindfulness network for American lawyers. Uh, and I think there is some comfort um, in practicing with people from your own profession. And I think that we have had success in the British police uh, British police forces with that in the U.S. Marines. So that I think there is something to to, to be said. Uh, for, for organising according to professions, but I thought I think there's uh, and also peer to peer is good, but I think there's something special about the teacher pupil relationship. As a teacher myself for 15 years, I knew I may have been disseminating knowledge to the kids, but I would be getting feedback from those kids myself that would make me a better teacher. So I something uh, you know if you've got the patient and the doctor, and they're operating in a mindful way or uh, uh, the pupil and the teacher, the prison officer and the prisoner, if, uh, if it's introduced in that setting, the, the, there is a valuable two-way uh, process that is occurring. It's not just the, the teacher imparting to the taught. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add something that I heard from one of you speak. Um, is it takes time a bit to this concept to actually get get kind of simmered down and, and settled of, of what it really means for one field of, of profession. Kind of um, for years dealing with these sorts of issues and this being an interest of mine, kind of I've generated a lot of fantasies how this can be worked like all <laughs> different places yeah. and so and I have had a, a, a plenty of time. But I think it's, it's the safest way actually to, um, and, and why we're sitting here is to give a, kind of give a shout out to people that we're trying to do this. We are serious about it. There are this is doable. This is you, you can make progress. And other people who are interested on in different fields, just to kind of give whatever support we have, uh, that they can establish some sort of practice and start experiencing the thing. And thus, the thing will start growing organically. And sometimes it will grow in a way that you don't expect. Chris Cullen, our teacher in Parliament, says that some people come to mindfulness and they, they're sitting there and they want the mindfulness to come in through the front door. They're expecting it, they're waiting it, come on, come on, come on. And <laughs> quite often it can be two or three weeks later where it affects you in a different way. So he says mindfulness doesn't come in through the front door, it comes up through the floorboards. So I think uh, it's, it's a, there are some very wise uh, mindfulness teachers and with, with some lovely sayings, and that's one of my favorite for mindfulness. So you might be expecting it through the front door and be disappointed that it wasn't there when you demanded it, but a few weeks later, it will come up through the, uh, through the floorboards. If I may add, um one of the things that uh, we did last uh, spring as well was that uh, once a year we gather all managers uh, from our governing area, which is the police and uh, uh, border guard agency, rescue agency, uh, internal security agency, uh, internal security academy, uh, emergency call center. Um, and all in all, we are around 8,000 people and uh, we've kind of uh, spotted out around uh, 200 managers uh, of uh, police stations, rescue stations, um, 
and uh, and higher command uh, level um, officers. So we gather them once a year uh, in spring and last spring we um, we um, were talking about um, management culture, and I decided to bring in also um, uh, an hour, or no, it was more than half an hour, uh, talk about uh, mindfulness. And um, it was casual style events, uh, but many were like, Ooh, what is that? Are they gone crazy in the ministry? <laughs> um, uh, luckily, only one person walked out out of 200. Um, but uh, the, the goal of mine for doing that was, was about actually um, introducing it. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I would like to ask uh, our UK colleagues, uh, have you encountered uh, kind of like stigmatization uh, in, in UK about uh, mental health uh, issue? Uh, I see that uh, that one of the obstacles uh, or in in in, the, in in Estonia as well, or that uh, it is an it is a topic that um, well, let's not talk about it. Uh, and but it is, in my opinion, one of the one of the three biggest issues of our next ten to fifteen years. Um, uh, future, uh, because uh, the work life uh, starts to demand more and more uh, self-regulation, self-management. Uh, uh, but if you are not self-aware, um, well, basically we will uh, uh, not succeed in that. But my my, my interest is is, is about uh, the the stigmatization of me mental uh, health issues. How you? kind of like tackled it in the in UK? It was five years ago, just over five, year ago, five years ago, that we introduced it. And at that time, there was a reluctance amongst UK politicians. They said, we will come on the course, but shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> they might think I'm crazy. Uh, and now, uh, with mindfulness science being developed, with mindfulness in uh, Time magazine, in in the newspapers, and programs, documentaries about it's in the zeitgeist, and it's much more acceptable to talk about it. So that, that, I think that's one issue. Uh, and once once something is being done, it makes it more easily uh, easier and acceptable for it to be done in other areas and in other countries. Uh, so I think that that might make it easier. Um, but the um, and, and and I think it's important that you you do not just pitch it to the twenty percent who may be struggling, or if they're younger people, 30% who may be struggling, that it is there to help people who struggle, but it's also there to help people who, to, to, to flourish, to live meaningful lives. And, you know, it, these are questions that were asked by philosophers in the West, Aristotle, the meaning of life, and, uh, and, and, and what makes a good life 2,000 years ago, asked 5,000 years ago in some of the Eastern traditions, uh, it's, it, it's been asked in the, in, in, uh, the Christian tradition, in the Jewish tradition. And I, I think asking those questions now, as we've become more materialistic, those questions seem to have been put down the, uh, uh, down the priority in the West to such an extent that uh, it, it, I think that's part of the reason that we're seeing this tsunami of mental ill health, that we need to be talking, not just about what we own, not just about what we do, but how we be, you know. And, and uh, th th those questions are being asked by many people in society. Um, and I think you should look on yourself as a, as, as a work of art, you know, that, that you, need to be, um, you need to be improving yourself throughout your life, that you're not just born there, uh, a teenager there, an adult there, and a worker there, that, that you can constantly improve yourself by using new, old, very old methods that have gone out of fa f fashion, new science to make sure that you are, when you do finally pop your clogs, you're the finished product. You're a lifetime's work <laughs> that you have uh, that you have t t noticed y yourself, you've felt yourself, you, you know who you are, and you've tried your best to improve that. 
And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. We tell our children to brush their teeth in the morning because teeth hygiene, oral hygiene, is very, very important. We say, uh, brush, your, uh, brush your hair, uh, uh, if you've got any, a <laughs> hundred times a day, and you will have nice, shiny hair. Uh, if your feet aren't working too well, go and see a, uh, uh, a foot doctor, and you can wear the arches because foot health is very, very important. Physical health, 10,000 steps a day is very important. So why is it so crazy, so ludicrous that you should look after your mental health? And not just your mental ill health, but your mental positive health. And I think there is a paradigm shift that is needed in society to recognise that looking after your mental good health, your human flourishing, uh, is a good thing and, uh, and, and, and is worthy of, of, of concentration. So, so we've seen a huge shift in the UK over, over the last uh, five years, and it's been sort of a multi-layered approach, like all the petals of a flower all opening at the same time. There's been programmes in work, there's been high-profile actors, musicians, the royal family, politicians, have all just suddenly started talking about it. And so it's been a public health programme, been a workplace, and this thing called um, Time to Think and Rethink Mental Illness, and then these brand names for for why we should all be talking about this, why it's an organisational business priority as well as individuals. So it requires all the different parts of society to basically get the message and to, and, and, and to, and to work on it together. Um, just building on what Chris said about you know being our own life's work, and there's a really... It, 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 it's, it's an old uh, uh, and, and actually for a very Western idea that we've sort of started to forget. Um, in German, I think it's Bildung, um, this, uh, this idea of sort of self-authoring and, se and self-development which um, this historian that I, s I heard recently said that it's probably behind the Scandinavian success story of the 20th century. That um, in, in the mid-19th century, Scandinavia was one of the poorest areas, in, 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 in mainly agricultural, um, behind all the, the rest of Europe. Um, when they realised that full emancipation was coming, everyone was going to vote basically, to decide the future of Denmark or Sweden or whatever. They were like, well, these farmers don't know anything outside of their villages. They don't know what Sweden is and why they should care about it and why they should care about the interests outside of their village. So they actually developed a retreat program where 15% of the agrarian farmer population went on retreat between four to six months in retreat centres where they learnt new folk songs and they learnt new ways to make yoghurt and to, like cool stuff basically in the, in, 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 the, in the 19th century. So they could go home to their villages and they'll be really cool because they had all this like the new songs and the new technologies but also they learnt to go into themselves and they learnt to basically find themselves in the course of four to six months. They learnt about the history of Sweden and they learnt about some sort of political philosophy but particularly what kind of moral and ethics are and, and what the internal world is and how it has an impact on the external world. And this historian was basically saying that there were hundreds of these retreat centres and this is what helped them to develop a democracy which was largely sort of social democratic and, and led to some of the great successes of the last 150 years. They're saying that the Scandinavian countries have forgotten that now and there's still a budget for these centres but they teach people guitar and Japanese and things rather than internal uh, moral and sort of um, philosophical principles uh, and they want to kind of recapture that spirit. I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is uh, Rafa Ulligol and, uh, and also uh, I was uh, thinking about uh, Denmark when Denmark um, uh, was basically uh, became a very small country. It used to be a much bigger kingdom and in the 1860 they became a very small country and they, they were really afraid like what are what our people going to they're going to be feeling so bad as for, because of their nationality. They used to be big and now they're small. They're losing their identities. And then they also introduced this extra school year. After the ninth grade, you have this extra year where you do all this nice stuff and you become cool and you get to know who you are, basically. So, so this was like, uh, I have also thought about in Estonia, we are like really scared of, uh, because we are so few, we think we're going to disappear from the earth and we want to force people to give uh, birth with uh, by law. So, <laughs> so I think instead of that, uh, also why, uh, why we should uh, start this, uh, this uh, revolution to actually give the, the people the tools to also, uh, also know who they are and be their, their best self is like very... Uh, uh, it's a very patriotic thing in a way, and, and I think this is one way to put it uh, for uh, for people who are criticizing this uh, this kind of and being scared of this being uh, some kind of esoteric uh, 
esoteric movements uh, so that it's actually a very patriotic and uh, and uh, human human thing to do but i think in estonia we are very um, uh, we are we really believe in education and always uh, also for for politicians education is always like yeah yeah the best thing to deal with it's very popular even though it's very difficult it's still kids and education is a good theme and uh, and i think ayanus maybe would like to comment i think maybe that's one of the reasons why also with mindfulness we have such good uh, uh, already uh, such wide, uh, more experience within education, but the things happening in mental health we just mm -hmm. don't hear about. But maybe you want to ex elaborate. Um, just to kind of comment to reflect back on that, I've been, um, uh, because we're in partnership with uh, also the the um, umbrella organization of mental health in Estonia, Vatek, and it's just annoying. It's just annoying to sit there and hear all this kind of rah, 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 what's going on, and and just it's a sim similar this kind of um, what you called the um, um, fatigue of uh, uh, compassion fatigue. It's just uh, you, if you're on, in the medical profession level or you know psychiatrist and everything, it's just like uh, you can't take it. it it's this exhausting. And when you're trying to campaign based on that, I think it's just um, wears people off. And I'm just being very kind of drastic at the moment. But I think really for us the, the to put forth the positive side of things and really talk about flourishing uh, would generate that much more interest and, and traction. And that's kind of you know talking about my fantasies um, about uh, mindfulness and how to Estonia could be um, um, flourishing with uh, with uh, with their people is is we need to get mindfulness practices to our defense budget because if we don't have people who are kind of present who are like home kodusomadega. Kind of, what's the point of, of having this fancy and quite expensive uh, uh, um, uh, state to uh, uh, worry about and try to defend and everything? Like people are our strategic assets, and it's kind of yes, kind of one way to um, uh, give something back, or one one way is to help through education but it's not only education i mean it, it's very core of being human being and uh, it, it's it's much more than that it's not about knowledge it's like a certainty of that we we have a place to be and we have all this i don't know uh, family values and everything it's kind of more than education it it comes much closer to the skin than uh, than this, if you take long time, you go <laughs> beyond like me. But I think, uh, kind of, if we're paying for the NATO, um, sooner or later we need to start uh, counting in the psychological warfare costs. Mm -hmm. And from where we, we are going to find any better uh, defense for psychological warfare than through these mindfulness tactics. There are none. There are no pills for uh, kind of zoning out for uh, Facebook uh, posts that nudge you being uh, extremist of kind of left side or right side. No pills can work. Only what you can do with your mind and not even kind of information you give. People don't give shit about the information. I'm sorry. They're showing a chart of socks sales. And people interpret it perfectly that the sock sales are sucking. And when they kind of change the same thing, change to the political view, people are completely disregarding information they're seeing like as negative. No, 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 it's all good. So that's what kind of information doesn't get us. Um, it's deeper than that. And we, I think, living more and more in the world than uh, we need... Uh, some vaccination. <laughs> okay, uh, I must, um, of course, uh, defend the budget now, <laughs> because uh, as a politician, I hear this daily that everyone wants to get their own percentage of the budget, which should be fixed forever. 
So uh, actually, uh, maybe our UK colleagues can say how little the state actually in the UK has founded all these uh, brilliant things that they have done and how much private money has actually gone into this. And maybe for the last part, before we take some questions, uh, I think our next step in Estonia would be, um, or why we also uh, arranged this event, to gather all these people who are actually interested in this field, who are already very active doing things, and now we are going to put up this signpost that says that it's okay, and let's uh, change our uh, experiences and... Uh, and think together about how we proceed to, to because I think uh, we cannot rely on the state budget totally. I think uh, we should definitely do all of these things and we should have the private sector, the businesses, the leaders. Uh, we have already today many people have approached me who are, uh, who are dealing in the private sector. Also, obviously, the, the public sector who is employing uh, lots of people in Estonia, actually. And uh, and also NGOs who are already uh, already working, but uh, but maybe you could say a little bit how the uh, mindfulness uh, initiative came up and with the different uh, sectors operating together and uh, and also about the financing a little bit. Okay, this is very, very good. Uh, initially, just to clarify that the mindfulness initiative is an NGO that's entirely funded by private philanthropy, so by charitable mm -hmm. giving. Uh, people assume that we might get government money for everything that's been done, but no, it's um, it's been all organically mainly volunteer effort. Um, so, so the uh, uh, in health, when we have a national health service, it's very important that the government, or rather th you know, through the NHS, pays for mindfulness training for those who would benefit from it, and it will save the government money by spending money on preventing depression and anxiety. So it's not, it's not a zero-sum game. I mean, you're actually gaining stuff by having a preventative mindset. Uh, and that's theoretically been happening for 13, 14 years now in the UK. Uh, however, in all the other areas of, of, of life, you know, schools, there's been uh, very little central money. It's individual schools having the option to spend money on mindfulness. It's been very organic, very very grassroots, um, and so uh, so yeah. There's a, outside of healthcare so far, there's been almost no no public funding. Um, so just yeah, reality check. <laughs> and uh, if I could just add to that, that when we drew up the draft document for the mindfulness uh, mindful nation, uh, one of the inputs from Professor. Richard Layard, who was the co-founder of our Mind of Mindfulness group, a health economist, he said it's important to quantify the cost savings. Uh, and that's the UK Treasury start to look if there's a cost saving of one to seven. So if we put a pound down and we save seven pound, the Treasury will start to look at that for public policy. Uh, and when we came up with a statistic of uh, one to 15, then we were hoping that UK ministers will then look seriously at that. So I think there needs to be a health uh, economy uh, uh, analysis of any intervention. And just to say, uh, repeat what Jamie said, the, the Mindful Nation report uh, didn't have a penny of public funding. These were about 25 to 30 mindfulness advocates from various fields who gave up their time freely. I don't think we even paid their travelling expenses to come to London and give evidence. So it is because, and many of you will be those people in the audience, that people have been touched by mindfulness and they realise it's a gift that they want to give away freely if they can. And if they can make a living out of it, and I think they should make a living out of it and spread mindfulness, all well and good. But many people uh, want to give that gift away and that's how it's, 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 it's gone so far. And I just think with state funding, it could go a lot, a lot higher and a lot quicker. There is a threat in that though, uh, in that if mindfulness expands too fast and too quickly, then the integrity may be lost. And that is a, an issue that concerns John Kabat-Zinn. Uh, and I think a way around that is to train our teachers and our medics at the age of 18 to 21 or 22 if you're a teacher, or 18 to 25 if you're a GP. And I was particularly stressed young people while they're learning their medical profession or their teaching profession, will be imbued with mindfulness 
and feel the benefit of mindfulness will develop integrity over four or seven years and then go on, the, uh, on to touch the minds of, of tens of thousands of patients or, or pupils. So the integrity by teaching it at that critical age would, would, would be in place uh, and you could scale up without losing that integrity. And um, for those of you who work in the field, there's a, a Cambridge study, uh, the biggest of its kind, published at the end of last year, November, um, who, uh, which looked at how uh, mindfulness for university students helps with psychological resilience, but also uh, potentially a range of other things like academic results. So it's a, it's a very strong study. Uh, you Sorry, Hi, um, I happen to be uh, one of the researchers in that study. So if anybody has questions about the University of Cambridge study where we, um, where we showed that teaching students mindfulness um, considerably reduced their stress levels and increased their resilience um, during exam term, um, come to talk to me later. We, we have time for a few questions from the audience, so please use the possibility. Okay. I have a question to, one, uh, to the Ministry of Interior. Uh, as you know, the police had problems with uh, suicides like last year. Uh, what are you going to do about this? Another question to maybe our government employee. What are you going to do about the problems which people face in Ida Viruma with lots of stress with working problems because of this main issue why people have stress. Yeah, thank you. Um, indeed, uh, we have uh, problems in our, uh, in our services um, and it, it's sad to say that uh, last year we've lost um, on average, uh, one uh, police officer per year for as a, as a suicide. Um, and what we've done in recent years in, in police service is that we've um, we've established a kaplanat. Uh, what would you call it? It's a chaplaincy, yeah, yeah, uh, where the the chaplains uh, are actually doing the patrols as well. But of course, the main job is um, is, is is giving. Um, um, mental support, um, uh, but we see that it's uh, it's, it's not enough, indeed. Uh, and one of the reasons why I last uh, spring brought up this uh, topic uh, to the to the um, top two hundred uh, day was to kind of like bring in it that it's okay to talk about the issue. It's uh, it's 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 okay to to address it. Uh, one of my fears in 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 um, in introducing it in, in Estonia as well is about uh, uh, how to avoid uh, the, the the concept that it's put into a box called bus uh, bus uh, project yeah buzzword mindfulness as a buzzword yeah. So, uh, so in that sense, it's uh, it was it was good to hear what you brought up just now about that uh, you you need to incrementally introduce it, uh, not as a pop yeah. here it is, mm -hmm. because then it will be labelled as as a, um, uh, just another trendy boss uh, thing. Yeah, but um, your questions are really uh, accurate. Uh, and and uh, but uh, again, it, there is probably not possibility to do it uh, step by step, uh, introducing it. Well, there is no abuse of ju justice because there is another question that is about suicides in jails that happened like last week. Yeah, well, I think these were exactly the questions we touched upon in the beginning of this uh, debate with bringing these kind of uh, programs. Maybe about this bars is also why. Um, it's, it's, we have been discussed among ourselves how many times that uh, the use of words is so important that if uh, sometimes even if you use uh, the word uh, mindfulness, it, uh, it is like this term uh, makes it into a boss. But it's also 
uh, why also the uh, the minutes of silence they have been or stillness they have been talking about these um, like uh, uh, mental uh, resilience and uh, and this kind of grit uh, things that, that that it's a and and I think it if if we ask this question like is is the phone where is technology a bars I mean it's uh, probably everyone is somehow convinced that uh, technology is here to stay somehow we are not going to turn back history and therefore I think also um, we have to stress this uh, connection that. Uh, that in the beginning of the day I was mentioning this, that the Industrial Revolution uh, uh, changed something in our physics, that now the next revolution of uh, IT and, uh, and communication might change something in our brains. And like the fitness culture started after the uh, Industrial Revolution a little bit later, now I think this kind of inner human capacity or cognitive uh, skills uh, um, force has to come up like uh, to stay not not as a boss but as as the thing of being human as the thing integrated into education and into all education and if to also shortly answer the question about eastern estonia i think there is no specific these are things that concern all of us you can be the most successful, the per people who burn out, they can be successful as hell, but they are just the same, in the same shit of being a human being, basically. And also, um, from uh, Vaikus Aminatid's side, we've uh, just uh, been able to train three Russian speakers uh, to be able to do these basic trainings in our schools. And uh, if you can provide a good network of how to actually reach these kind of um, schools, or organizations or places, would be very um, glad because we have a kind of problem of reaching into other culture. And so. Okay, so do we have some more people who want to address the uh, panelists? Yes. Uh, I have a question that's been on my mind for some time now uh, regarding mindfulness being a technique to still continue your fully busy life in your everyday business and mindfulness actually changing how people see their lives, how they value things in life, how they change their everyday choices maybe. Do you see any changes in that as well in uh, considering your experiences in Britain? or? Is it also possible that mindfulness might become like a technique to still continue the business of the life and not actually make any changes in how they lead their lives? Uh, speaking as someone who's burnt out twice in the last three years, <laughs> uh, I can tell you that it doesn't make you immune to, to anxiety, depression or burnout, actually. Uh, that people report, although that they, that they don't experience those things, they actually the quality of it's different, like you have a bit more space, there's less suffering and distress, but you still have exhaustion or you still have sort of tightness in the chest and, and anxiety. So the relationship between mindfulness and these things is actually quite complicated. On the whole, it reduces them, but when they do arise, it's easier to deal with them, but it doesn't make you completely immune. So uh, I'm someone who used these techniques to work at a much higher level until I burnt out. So I needed to con con combine mindful awareness throughout the day and, and, uh, and you know, sitting every morning because, not just because of the long-term benefit, like I'm, I'm, I'm doing this every morning because one day I'll be X, Y, and Z, but because on the day that I sit, that day is better. I make better healthier decisions, I make better, better you know, work decisions, I have better relationships. It's just worth spending that time on that day level before you think about the cumulative benefit. So I'm going from track, track now, but, um, you know, Although uh, I use those, my, if my attitude is one of having an imbalance between self-care and nourishing myself and wanting to do something in the world, then eventually I will exhaust myself. So it's, so it's a combination of kind of ethics, essentially. The ethic of, of, of work-life balance is, is still one that needs to be explored and, and, found and, 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 and re refined over time, uh, even if you're really mindful. Does that answer your question? Is that a bit. So, but, but 
on a, on a workplace level, okay, there, there are people who are using sort of shallow mindfulness techniques to, um, and uh, that's the only level that they're, they're dealing with it at. Often, actually, that's a seed that's planted that then grows later on. But, but sorry, go on. Well, uh, just to elaborate, that there's this, uh, I've been hearing it around me for many times, but it's kind of cool to say that you're busy all the time. Oh, yeah. So it's like you see, you hear it a lot. Like it's, it's kind of very cool to say that, no, um, I have to check my schedule. No, I'm busy two weeks now. Maybe we can schedule the coffee like after three weeks. Yeah. So it's kind of like, and also in the work field, it's really uh, like, uh, how do you say, it's appreciated to say that you're busy. Mm hmm. Because it's because it means you're really important, right? It kind of. So uh, and you're a good person because you know. mindfulness actually really reducing that on like a society level. Mm -hmm. We kind of let go of it. I guess what I'm saying is that mindfulness can't do it alone, and that, that, that what we're talking about here is a, sh a shift in ethics and values, what is seen as a good life, and a successful life. And people like Arianna Huffington, you know, who founded the Huffington Post in the U.S., she's got this thing called Thrive written books about it. She's one of many people that, you know, although she supports mindfulness and she practices it, she isn't really talking about mindfulness. She's talking about exactly what you're saying. This, this sort of, how, the way in which we see ourselves and we, and, and, and we frame what a successful, effective, good person is, needs to shift. I just, one quick note. Um, the mindfulness or the, in the world, it's a, the word itself gives a doubt that you would just be more mindful if you're bullshitting yourself. It doesn't do anything else. It just gives you the ability to see perhaps more clearer than you would do otherwise. So if you want to be busy, if it's part of your, mm. you know, image, that's it. But, but I think what you were talking about maybe a little bit is like, can we change the values in society? I think uh, definitely if we put up these signposts, and it, if we take this risk that these things m might sound a bit trendy or something, I think that's okay. But I think that's when the personal stories come into place. And like Chris was saying, some of the MPs came out saying openly that they had problems with depression. And uh, and, and I mean, if, if we do want to change values, we have to talk about things. Because otherwise, we just somehow sit at home and think like only only I am okay, I'm, it's cool to say I'm stressed, but if you're like burnt out, it's not very cool <laughs> anymore. So, uh, so I think it's, it's and, and also with the, uh, I like the um, analogy with uh, brushing your teeth. I mean, if you, if you like, uh, you don't stop brushing your teeth when you are stressed. But for some reason, if we are like really busy at work, we somehow, like Chris said, in a, in a situation of uh, like uh, crisis, we take away these things that nourish us. Like if, if we come to a life where we don't compromise with ourselves, like I get all the time this that uh, like uh, being a pa being a parent also you you need to actually make sure that you are like well in your head and if you need your time for yourself and if you if you don't take it you cannot give the kids anything because then you disappear somehow so so we shouldn't also like uh, blame people for for trying to find this kind of balance and maybe not have meetings in the evenings and all these things, but these values take time, probably, this change. If I can, <coughs> if I can say, uh, I mean, it's a fundamental uh, question that everybody has to ask themselves. You know, do we work to live or live to work? You know, if, and many of us don't ask that question, we just drift into it. We get on that treadmill and we don't stop until we burn out or until we retire. And there are so many, th th there's a, uh, a British journalist and author called uh, uh, Oliver James. He wrote the book Affluenza. And he maintains that much of the mental distress in the West has come from advertising. And that after the Second World War in America, because they had a wartime economy and they produced the the boats and the aeroplanes and the, 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 when the war stopped they had this capacity which there was uh, they had a massive supply but minimum demand and that advertising had to convince people that they needed a, a, a second or a third car or they needed a, a boat or, or, or whatever and that materialism took off after the second world war and was heightened in the 1980s with laissez-faire economics with the uh, 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 with, th there is no such thing as society, there are just individuals 
uh, and we became atomized and uh, those spiritual connections or those uh, human connections had dissipated and it became about materialism and there's another saying that we we use money we haven't got to buy goods we don't need to impress people we don't like and I, I just think mindfulness can touch up on all of these things and you know we, we can carry on being materialistic but maybe not so materialistic it can help us ask just take a step back you know that we are human beings and not human doings and I just think you know and I'm still addressing these questions you know at my age and it is a continual program but I just think if we can teach these skills and these gifts to children that the younger we can teach them you know the less that they're going to go on that treadmill for the rest of their lives to please for the pen okay Villa. last question I just um, representing the business side of, uh, of mindfulness then yes I I, I just uh, want to avoid that, uh, that there is a kind of understanding that mindfulness and consciousness is making you like more lazy or mm. more mm. like uh, mm. taking uh, off the speed or everything mm. yes the first reaction is that you like kind of step back but after that it allows you to be as busy as it's mm -hmm. needed mm. so you can be like 10 times more busy if you see consciously decide to do so so it uh, it's exactly the uh, i like about it uh, is that complete uh, completely you're like completely free you can be like better buddhist with uh, being mindful you can be better islamist if you like mindful you can be better businessman if you're mindful you can be better in uh, being lazy if you're mindful <laughs> so it's like uh, it's not going towards only one direction it's actually it's tool giving you complete uh, like freedom to yeah. do whatever you do in your life uh, in a better way. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and of course, some things, and a lot of things actually, to be honest, will drop off <laughs> if you're mindful. You just understand that you are like uh, putting a lot of energy and time <laughs> to things what actually... And some of those things are some like coffee meetings. And then you, you will tell that my calendar is full, but your calendar is full for yourself. <laughs> not yeah. for other coffee meetings. I think it all comes down to that question of values that, that Yoko mentioned. Um, yeah. Why are you why are you working? I will work as much as I can. I really believe in what I'm I'm doing. It gives me a tremendous amount of meaning. Yeah. And I and I enjoy it. Like it's not a case of chilling out for me. The reason the reason I'm self caring and working less is to do more over the long term. You know, play the long game, a marathon, not a sprint type thing. So I completely agree with you. Like, if you have a real burning passion, particularly if it's like intrinsic motivation towards like, you know, love, community, meaning, purpose, um, then then sure, work as hard as you want to. <laughs> you know. Indeed, um, I started off uh, introducing myself uh, and saying that um, I can't exactly recall uh, where did uh, the, the the topic came to my um, uh, radar, but uh, during listening uh, the talks, kind of like. Um, Oh, yeah, from the from the deep uh, memory started uh, to come up, uh, uh, and I, I understood where it came actually to my uh, radar. It was executive coaching uh, that I was um, was going through trainings. So it was like four or five years ago, uh, and that kind of brought me to uh, to mindfulness. So um, one of the things and and ways to 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 bring it also into organizations is through. Um, uh, introducing that to also executive coaching um, um, training sessions uh, because uh, that that gives an uh, an opening in, in a way. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I'm going to move here and uh, thanks all the panelists. Okay, Anna, stop calypso now. Oh yeah, me. Uh, I'll say a few words in Estonian. Ikkagi eesti keeles kannatuke siis ühe sõnaga, et edasiseks me, ma saadan kõigile, kes te olete osalenud, mul on kõigi teie meiliadressid olemas, kui nad teeni ilusti registreerisite selle, ka selle salvestuse täna, sest me paneme sinne eesti keelse tõlke juurde, ma panen sinna ka need linkid, kust saab siis neid Mindfulness Initiative'i materjale alla laadida ja, ja edaspidi siis vastake sellele meilile või kirjutage Jannu selle, kui te olete huvitatud sellest nii-öelda järgnevast, protsessis, sest häid asju tulebki teha nii nagu sul oleks sada aastat neid teha ja, ja teha seda põhjalikult ja, ja pika sihiga ja, ja ma arvan, et 
Et meie eesmärk Jannusega on olnud just see, et, et, et näha, et Eestis on tegelikult juba nii palju inimesi, kes, kes teavad midagi, kes teevad midagi ja, ja lihtsalt, et mõelda edasi, mis on need järgmised sammud, kus võibolla siis need erinevad sektorid saaks kokku tulla, et olgu selleks siis juhendajate koolitamine, mingit, no, mingi hetk tekib ka nagu vajadus, et kas on vaja mingit standardeid, eks ole, et, et kas on nagu mingit konkreetsed, ainult need MBSR ja MBCT, eks ole, ja, ja et igatahes, et, et see kindlasti ei jää nagu oma loodetavasti meie viimaseks um, kohtumiseks. Uh, so, um, to wrap up, just huge thanks to everyone, especially obviously to uh, my colleagues from the UK, to Jamie and Chris for uh, putting up the sign and saying this is cool, <laughs> do it. Mm -hmm. And it's not only cool, but it's uh, it's normal, it's uh, very human, and uh, it's the it's the way forward. And uh, I know uh, the embassy has left, but uh, but still also it's it's very much thanks to them and uh, to Vaiku Seminutid for for this cooperation and also Lauri for for coming on the panel, coming out of the closet. We all like it. <laughs> So, uh, so let's continue and, uh, and please do stay in touch and, uh, and I will send the materials and a nice lady will show you out so you don't get lost and stuck in this castle. Thank you. <laughs>